the base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's a Wednesday. It's a packed Wednesday because we have a lot of MLS matches tonight. So we will have an MLS Wednesday whip around at 1030. We'll have Mike Conti on. It's a Wednesday. He's always with us on a Wednesday. That'll be at 10 o'clock. We'll catch up on the latest about Atlanta United then. We'll have Dylan Butler on today as opposed to Tuesday because Tuesday didn't exist in the SDH universe. It was spent on a golf course. Um, I'm sure we'll tell stories about that at some point. Jarrett's not here, so you can tell how it went for him. Um, He did survive. There were a few questions at times, especially early on if he would. He did. He did. Um, He got better as the day went on. He definitely improved as the day went on. Um, Starting from a a, a very, very far back position in a golf experience and uh, recent experience. So, yeah, he got better as the day went on. It was a fun day out on the links uh, over at Lake Spivey down on the south side of town. So Tuesday didn't happen. Dylan Butler joins us today at 930. But the big news of the day to not waste any time is the equal pay achievement between the U.S. women's national team, the U.S. men's national team, U.S. soccer gets it done. They had been working towards this. A settlement had been reached on previous litigation between the women's national team and the federation that was contingent on a CBA getting done. Of course, because it's what we all do when we're trying to get some some clicks. It's, oh, what about if they don't get a CBA done? Oh, this means nothing. Yeah, they were going to get it done. They did. Now, how they got it done is not what I expected. And how they got it done is something that is honestly 100% groundbreaking in what they did. U.S. soccer can definitively claim and state and be accurate in saying this that they are the first federation to truly achieve equal pay. Nobody else does it this way. And I didn't think they'd be able to get it done this way. I really didn't. This is a situation where all of the other things, and look, the federation made their bid. They did not keep the CBAs, even when they were trying to get to more equalization, they didn't keep them equal they got out of whack with okay then the men got a new cba and they didn't upgrade the women's cba on per diems on you know level of hotels that kind of stuff that was just that's just stupid that's just bad oversight so they were getting down the road on that you had the questions about salary on the women's side because in previous cbas they had negotiated salaries from the federation as opposed to higher per game amounts. Remember, in the last, the period that covered the litigation, everything outside of World Cup bonuses, and we'll get there in a minute, everything outside of that, the women actually made more than the men. The World Cup bonuses is what threw it off. The women wanted the salary up front the last time around. That's not what they were wanting this time around. They wanted more equalization across the board. And that was the only way they were going to get this kind of thing done with the Federation. Now, there are a couple of things. There's a certain number of players that will get some kind of benefits. Um, the seems like the, the coach will have the ability to, to do that. That is a little odd. And I'll, I'll be very curious to see how that gets used or if it causes problems when one player gets it and another player doesn't. The players are all playing at better clubs and better club situations in their day-to-day now than they were in previous CBAs, so it might not be as big of a deal. In the past, that was very much needed. Now, it's not as needed because the women's professional game has improved a great deal. It's not on the same level as the men's game in terms of revenue, in terms of salary, in terms of all of those aspects. It's getting there, but there's room to grow. Um, But on the Federation side, the women's national team and the men's national team are in the same place in terms of revenue widely. The one area they weren't and the area that U.S. soccer had no control over is the FIFA bonuses. And I think this has been just watching the reaction from it this morning as this piece of news came across about an hour to an hour and a half ago. This part has been completely pushed down in the article if it's really highlighted much at all there's been a lot of a lot of boilerplate stuff a lot of you know the the usual things that would get said here not getting into the real achievement in this and to me the real achievement 
is the fact that they are truly going to equalize World Cup revenues that get paid out to the players. Nobody else, even other countries that have set up equal pay relationships with their men's and women's national teams, have not done it this way. They've done a percentage. That's what I thought U.S. soccer would end up doing. A percentage, if the, the men got 90% of the, the bonus money that was paid out by FIFA for wherever they finish in the Men's World Cup, that the women would get 90% of whatever FIFA paid out for the Women's World Cup, which is not the same. And that's on FIFA. And look, the revenues are different. I mean, I'm sorry, there's no way around that. The revenues are different for the Men's and the Women's World Cups. FIFA pays out the bonuses in too big of a discrepancy. But FIFA pays out bonuses for each tournament, and they're not the same. So what U.S. soccer is going to do, and this is the groundbreaking portion, and this is the part that I, I understand. Mitch Purse, for example, said, you know, you don't reward somebody for doing what they should already have been doing. And this is not that to me. They should have, U.S. soccer should have been doing a lot of things before this. Do not misunderstand me, please. They should have been. They should have gotten things more right than they did the bonus money is a different thing and when nobody else in the world is doing it this way yeah i think they do deserve some credit the men could have tried to hold on to what they've been getting bonus wise because ultimately the men are going to give up money right or wrong the men are going to give up money in what they would have gotten for, say, making the quarterfinals or the round of 16 of a World Cup, which would have been more than the overall amount U.S. soccer got for what the women would get for winning the World Cup. That's not U.S. soccer's fault. That's FIFA's fault. But the men have agreed to this. And this was something U.S. soccer said from the very beginning. They had to have everything in line with both CBAs. I didn't think they could pull it off. They did. And it's a credit to Cindy Parlo Cone. It's a credit to both of the players associations. And this is groundbreaking. This is something that I do think everyone should get applauded for. Everyone. Everyone involved in it. Because Norway, which is one that has, has talked about having equal pay, they don't do this. Australia is one that has announced that they have equal pay. They don't do this. They do a, the same percentage. U.S. soccer in the next World Cup cycle, this one in 22 for the men, 23 for the women, they are going to take the FIFA World Cup money, put it in a pool, and they are going to divide it out equally between all the members of those rosters. 90% of the money that comes in is going to go to the players equally. 10% is going to go to the federation. Now, that changes a little bit in the next cycle. I think it's more like 70-30 or 80-20. That's groundbreaking. That's incredible. And that deserves credit. It does. Because nobody else is doing it that way. Full credit to U.S. Soccer getting this done. Full credit to the Women's Players Association, the Men's Players Association, everybody working together to create something that it's not even, I, I, and this is where I, I do push back a little bit. It's not even that it should have been done this way all along. It's that U.S. soccer is out in front of everybody else in the world doing it this way. That's a different conversation. And that does need to be applauded because they could have done the percentage route. I don't know if the women would have agreed to it. That would have been equal in a lot of people's minds. U.S. soccer went above and beyond. And all of the players involved in the players associations went above and beyond to get this done. So full credit to everybody involved. I think they do deserve gold stars and they do deserve the applause for that. And now keep it this way and now continue to invest in growing the game and in, in growing the level of play. And hopefully you get the men bringing in more money on the men's side and the women continuing to be one of the best in the world and everybody wins on the other side of it. I thought it was interesting what Walker Zimmerman said uh, when the information came out about an hour and a half ago. And the men had initially pulled back from the negotiations. They sat and observed the women's side. Then they became active participants again. And then it hit the men when they came back to the table and sitting down at the bargaining table with the women 
and, you know, just understanding, okay, this is the dynamic here that we're dealing with. And that was the encouragement that the men's side needed to understand the gravity of it all. And I don't think the men pulled back in any kind of a negative way. I don't, I don't know where you were going with that, John, but I I never got that sense that the men were like, no, we're not going to do this. Well, I was just, it's like, uh, back last June after the, the deal fell through back, uh, that's what I was discussing. Just, you know, when the proposed deal fell through back last June, they set in on the women's negotiations, according to the athletic as observers. And then they made that next step of sitting down with the women again. And when the women's deal fell through last June, not when they're, when the men's deal fell okay. through last year. And okay. I, leave, leave that to the side. I think that doesn't really apply to what ended up happening because I, I don't want it to come off like, okay, well then the men walked out of negotiations. Cause I don't think that's accurate at all. And the women had litigation with the Federation. That was part of the negotiations that the men had nothing to do with and probably didn't need to be anything involved in there. So I, I don't think it's a like for like comparison. Sorry, go ahead. No, but just the, just the notion of sometimes the easiest thing will trigger going forward. And sometimes instead of having one side talking over here and another side talking over here and the conversations being separate, sometimes sitting down at the table being the simplest thing and understanding where the other side is coming from, that can really hit home for you. And it did for the men here and understanding where the women were coming from. It's, and we need to do this was the, the, I guess, the seeming revelation here. Once you sit down with the other side and the men sitting down with the women as a part of the negotiation, it's like, yeah, we do need to do this. And I thought that that was uh, cool to hear from Walker Zimmerman. It's like sometimes it is that most simplest thing that can trigger something this historic. And it seems to have done that. I don't think it's that simple though, John. Like, I don't think it's hearing somebody say we should do this and then saying, yeah, cool, let's do it. I I don't think it's the simplest thing. I I think this is actually a really hard thing to do. I think this is a really hard setup to create. Um, And U S soccer was in the position that they had to, from a potentially legal side of things, although they had won the initial round of the the equal pay lawsuit and they still settled. I feel like they thought they, they had to do this from also, again, things can change on appeal, of course, from a legal standpoint, they felt like they had to do this from a uh, doing the right thing from a PR perspective. Absolutely. That was part of it. Um, The men, we're not going to be able to fight against that at that point either. And it wasn't going to help them in any way. Um, Ultimately, when you get down to who is going to, it's not a winners or a losers thing, although that's what everybody does in a negotiation. The men are potentially going to make less because of this part of the agreement. The rest of it's all the same. They didn't like, they didn't pull back men's bonus money to equal with the women. No, they, they bumped the women up as they should have, as it should have been there all along, as was honestly intended all along. And they screwed it up because the Federation was mismanaged for a long time. It's the bonus money changing. That is a massive change. Again, it, it's not simple because if it was simple, Norway would have done it. Australia would have done it. Other countries would have already done this. Nobody else has. It's a big partnership between the men's national team, the women's national team, and the federation. And that's not easy because they're all in different places and they all have had different histories and they all have different relationships, honestly. There's been friction between the women and the men. There's been friction between the men and the women. There's been friction with both with the federation at different points over the years. And this stuff carries over. People remember negotiations that went wrong in the past, and it's the stuff that is is there. There's a lot of a lot of water down there that this bridge has been built pretty high to go over it, but it's a big bridge. It's a huge bridge, and and to get to this point, it's incredible. From Cindy Parlo Cone, in my opinion, as the leader of the federation, to get everybody in the same place and get this done. This can be the way forward. Now, I also think, and as as Walker Zimmerman said. I also think that this needs to be used as a talking point with FIFA 
in and that was where I thought the long term play was going to be. They'd go percentage equal and then say we're all going to fight FIFA on increasing the amount on the Women's World Cup, which is going to double this year, but it's doubling from like nothing. Yeah. So, yay, it's doubling. It's still not where it should be. And then the argument of where should it be in comparison to the Men's World Cup is not an easy one to answer. It, it really isn't when you talk about revenues from the two events. It's not easy to answer where that those amounts should be. Should they be exactly equal in what FIFA pays out to federations? FIFA has the money to do it, but they would be then investing more on one side, which could absolutely argue that they should. And I have no problem with it if that's the route they go. But the revenues that come in are not the same. And when people point that out, that is valid. That That is valid. We, we can't ignore that and stick our head in the sand and say that it's not. So I thought it would be a longer term play to convince FIFA. Now U.S. soccer has ramped that up quickly to push on FIFA because you think the French women's national team, you think the English women's national team, you think the German women's national team, the Spanish, all big, powerful federations. The women's national teams are growing in importance in all of those. You don't think they're going to see this and say, hey, look at what they did. And now there's going to be arguments all around the world in different ways about, well, the U.S. is different. Well, no. Well, we can't do that here. Well, the U.S. soccer and the women and the men in this situation have pushed that conversation forward worldwide now. And I don't think it's a simple thing. I truly don't. I think that is not giving enough credit to this step forward because it's a big step. It is a big step to take the World Cup money from both the men and the women, pull it together, then divide it out equally. If it was such an easy step, somebody else would have done it. Nobody has. And that deserves credit, in my opinion. And Cindy Parlo Cohn, absolutely the right person to take over after Carlos Cordero. Uh, drove U.S. soccer off the road into a ditch and then had the gall to try to get back in the driver's wheel. Luckily, he did not. Yes, Cindy Parlo Cohn has relationships to build with the youth side. There are a lot of constituencies in U.S. soccer that have very different opinions on everything, on breathing, let alone how to run a soccer federation. And they all have their own little fiefdoms that they have to worry about. Cone has work to do in some of those fiefdoms to build better relationships. It's a fact. Cordero had built relationships with some of them and butchered some others. But I am so thankful that Cindy Parlo Cone, one, became president of U.S. soccer when Cordero ran the car into the ditch. Two, won the election to stay there because this, along with many other things that have happened, they don't happen without her in charge. She is, in a very short period of time, the most impactful U.S. soccer president outside of Alan Rothenberg. Rothenberg fixed everything with the World Cup in 94, and we know what World Cup 94 did for soccer in this country. What Cindy Parlo Cohn has done, with not just this, this announcement, but a lot of other things, really setting the bar very high for what the Federation can be and, and being a leader in the game worldwide it's incredibly impressive and credit does need to be given there i i understand the idea of you know should have been equal all along the world cup prize money the bonus money that's not as easy of a conversation to say it should have been equal they got there and they got it done and that deserves a ton of credit and at the same time you mentioned now all right given what u.s soccer has done today with the World Cup coming to this hemisphere in 2026, you're going to have this ramp up of, all right, so the U.S. has done this, and it's going to have a World Cup in the United States and Canada and Mexico in 2026. And I'm fairly confident that it will be one of the talking points that will continue to be emphasized between now and then, and then once again in 2026, if things haven't changed by then, to continue to remind FIFA and the world what U.S. soccer has done in this situation. So I think that it will be a it should be a continual talking point, and it will be, and I think it'll be emphasized even more so in 2026 when the World Cup is here in this hemisphere. 
No, it'll be emphasized in 23 during the Women's World Cup because that's the one that needs more investment in it and more investment in the prize pool. And it'll be emphasized in 27, which could be in the U.S. on the Women's World Cup side. The U.S. is going to bid for either 27 or 31. 31 is looking a little more complicated. Uh, There's a Rugby World Cup coming to the U.S., there's something else that could make it a little more complicated and 27 might be a better fit, but that's a lot to ask the Federation to do with back-to-back world cups. The women's world cup is not as big, especially in a 48 team men's world cup as we're going to see in 26. It's not as big literally, um, but they would make it very big. So uh, that's a lot. Um, Is it doable? Yeah, it's doable, but, it's going to be either 27 or 31. That's when the conversation gets louder because the conversation, in my opinion, is not going to override the men's world cup about the women's world cup needing more investment in it. It's going to be when the women's world cup comes around and that's when it should be. And that's when FIFA has to have their feet held to the fire and 26 will be big. It'll be huge in what it is. If the U S host in 27, that's on the women's world cup. That's where it will put a lot of pressure on FIFA. And look at what we've done in back-to-back World Cups. Look at all the revenue that we have made in back-to-back World Cups because that Women's World Cup in 27 could be, outside of the two Men's World Cups in the United States in 94 and 26, the third most lucrative tournament that FIFA's ever done. It would have that kind of potential if things go well. And then the arguments start to change on how much money can you actually put to a bonus pool. Well, you can put more than you are. And should it be the exact same amount? That's a different conversation. Can it be? It can be. It can be because FIFA has money and they're going to make so much from these events. And if the U.S. hosts back to back, yeah, it, it's back to back men's and women's. Yeah, it's going to be ridiculous. Uh, some other things on the board before we get into Dylan joining us here in just a couple of minutes. Um, yesterday in England, England. John, we have a race going down to the last day. There there were some questions on if this would happen. Liverpool, look, took a little bit of a gamble. It wasn't easy for them at Southampton, but they got it done. Joel Matip in the 67th minute with the winner. Liverpool actually fell behind. Manchester City has to take care of business on the weekend now. Yeah, nine changes for Liverpool going into this match with Southampton getting the early lead. And from that moment, it looked like Southampton, frankly, was afraid to play. And you get a goal to tie it at the break. Then you mentioned the Matip goal to make it 2-1. So right now it's 90 points to 89, and you're heading into the weekend. And so it's right there in front of you. Manchester City has to match the result of Liverpool and get into math and other things if other things don't happen. But the bottom line is, if you're Manchester City, you match what Liverpool does on the weekend on Championship Sunday, you come up with champions. Again, it's 90 points to 89. Goal difference is 72 to 66. So obviously there's a lot that would have to happen there, which probably which would not, unless common sense just completely abandons the Premier League on Sunday. But yeah, that's, that's it right now. One point difference heading into the last day. Uh, Nottingham Forest with an incredible comeback yesterday they get to the playoff final at Wembley but sadly it's marred because of a complete and utter moron who committed assault on uh, a player Um, just disgusting if you haven't seen this a Nottingham Forest fan running onto the pitch uh, headbutting Sheffield United captain Billy Sharp who's a former Nottingham Forest player Uh, it's assault that happens on the street it's assault if that happens anywhere outside of its assault. Now, police have confirmed a 31-year-old man been arrested on suspicion of assault, remains in custody. Um, Nottingham Forest issued a statement that they were appalled uh, about what happened. The club will work with authorities to locate the individual. Lifetime ban from Nottingham Forest. club also wanted to apologize to Billy personally and to Sheffield United. We talk about this because this stuff is happening more and more. There, there's no way you can stick your head in the sand about it. Uh, fans are running onto the field. Fans think that they can do these things. Um, this doesn't just happen out of nowhere. It is horrendous. A player on the field after losing in their season ending should not have to worry about a fan running onto the field not to celebrate their team doing something, but to attack this individual. 
one of the most disgusting acts I've ever seen. And this fan deserves more than a lifetime ban. It, everything that you get for assault, this person deserves it because it is horrendous. And sports teams are going to have to act in a more strong way going forward to prevent these things from happening. It's way too loose. We've seen it way too many times with people running onto the field generally to celebrate, not to headbutt people. This is is one of the, the nastiest things I've ever seen. So glad to know that somebody's been arrested. Uh, that name needs to be posted everywhere. They should not be at a football match in England, and they should be behind bars for assault. It, it's just horrendous. And what all of us, and, and MLS has to look at this, just like U.S. soccer has to look at this, just like everybody has to look at this, so it doesn't happen in other places. What has to be done to prevent it? I don't know. Um, more security, you know, stronger punishment. I, I don't know, but this is, it's gotten way too much. It, it's, it's horrendous. So I'm disgusted by it. I, I was shocked at seeing it. It's one of those that you, you hear about and you think it's bad and then you see it and it just blows your mind. So good to know he's arrested. Throw the key away for a while. Ban him from every game in England because that's not what Billy Sharp should have to be worried about in that moment. Shocking, disgusting. I mean, you've pretty much hit it. I mean, it's you see the you see the tagline, you see the headline, and then you do the search, you find the video, and you go. And I mean, it was stunning to see something like that, mm -hmm. and to think that a fan can sit there and say, "Yeah, I'm going to go down on the field and I'm going to headbutt this guy because, well, he doesn't play for us anymore." It's just, it's stupid, it's disgusting, and when you see stuff like that, call him out, find him, help the police track the guy down, go behind bars, be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, and do not let this guy into any football ground. I don't care if it's National League, Vonorama League, uh, Division Four. He does not belong in any kind of football ground because you've disrespected everything about the game doing something that's stupid. Let's bring it back around to something fun. Let's bring it back around to MLS. Dylan Butler's not going to run on the field and headbutt anybody. I know that much. Oh, wait a second. Wait, check the check. What's around the man's check? What's around? Yeah, can you see a little bit? Little scarf. Ah, back. very nice. Yeah, Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. See, the problem is, uh, John. Thank you so much for for sending it. By the way. Oh yeah. I, I'm 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 super conflicted on what like to to move and get get rid of. Right. Like. Oh, there's no there's no moving or get ridding. It's all in the stacking and the. See, all right. What are you, what are you talking about, John? The scars. Um, Dil Dylan. There, there. They sit there. You do have. If you want to see it, the things do have to move. Yeah. But I mean, you can you can sit there and, and go halvesies. You can sit there and overlap and go like I do behind me because I mean, there's a lot of halvesies going on behind me. John's not an interior decorator. But I got some over here as well. Like, see, yeah. I, I have more over oh, there. So. He's got the Campione's cup. Very nice. I was there. Excellent. Well, thanks for uh, rocking our scarf. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thanks for being part of the show, man. Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sending it. Oh, yeah, cool. no problem. No problem. Um, this is a weird Wednesday because one, we're usually with you on Tuesday, but we had to go golfing yesterday. We needed a day off. We we, we go out into the links. Uh, we've lost Jarrett. He might show up in the second hour of the show. Uh, he did leave the golf course in one piece. I was a little concerned about that early in the day. Um, but it's not just a normal Wednesday. We have a pretty much full slate of games tonight. So it is a full week. Busy. It is week 12. The weekend will be week 13. So it's a, it's 10 matches and, uh, you know, as MLS is, it's, it's varying degrees of, of interest and excitement. And, you know, I feel like, uh, there's levels of MLS after dark, right? Like mm -hmm. that's super exciting, but I feel like midweek MLS after dark, that's where it gets kind of crazy and strange and fun. Insomniac's delight is basically what <laughs> Yeah, it can really get off the rails in the midweek. Um, one thing, can can we lobby to get the MLS weeks in the calendar and the MLS weeks in MLS fantasy, like the same thing? Yeah, they're right? not, That's And it's hard. always confusing. It yeah. always throws me off because this is not, and we'll talk about it in the whip around at the end of the show. This is not a separate week in MLS Fantasy. It's no. a double match week for a lot of teams, and that's going to affect your strategy. So we'll try to break that down for you later. I want to get into a couple of teams, and one that we've talked about a lot, and I think we're on the same page. 
uh, that's leading the Eastern Conference right now, Montreal. They just they went to Charlotte, who's been great at home over the weekend. Yeah. Went to them, wrecked them, and Montreal is leading the way these days. Yeah, and and I, I think maybe around the league, people are starting to recognize, and maybe there's a surprise factor, but. I think any any regular viewers here uh, and listeners, they know that we've touted them from even last year, right? So no surprise for us. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's great to see. It's great to see that that level of consistency, right? That they're that they're showing. Um, it's probably it, it's probably a different conversation to have, but I feel like Georgi Mihailovic has picked the absolute perfect time to play his best football, knowing that he wants to get on that World Cup roster, uh, and he's making a really strong case for himself, right? So um, he's highly motivated to do that, and, and you know, he's he had a great uh, conversation with, uh, with Jillian Sakovich and, um, and Sam as well, uh, just about uh, how he's changed uh, it's, uh, on the call-up, excuse me, on, on MLSsoccer.com. Yeah. On, on, on one of the things that he's uh, he's worked on just with uh, his shooting, right? Like he, he said, I, look, I'm a pass first guy. That's I'm more excited about my assist than my goals. But Greg Berhalter told him at the, in the January camp, I need to see you scoring goals. I need to see you more dangerous in the attacking third. He took that to heart. And what we're seeing is, is, you know, he, he, he broke the numbers down too. He's really, he's really, uh, He's really smart. He he was saying how how many shots he took last year versus how many goals, and that percentage wasn't very good. So so he's getting into danger, more dangerous spots. He's finishing in and around the box. Um, what he had a sixth goal right last on on Saturday mm-hmm. of, of the season. Uh, so we've said about the shouts of, of of MVP, and he's right up there as well for that. But um, he leads the line certainly there, and uh, and. You know, you and I both, uh, I, I know Jason, uh, you and I both did, um, and I think John's in agreement too. I kind of scratched my head when Alistair Johnston leaves Nashville, right? Like, how does yeah. he not fit? He was perfect there, and he's been such a breath of fresh air in Montreal. And now you look at Nashville, and you're kind of like, well, you never really replaced him, right? And, no. and you certainly could use him now, but um, I think that was a great piece of business for them as well. Um, and then the, the young guy stepping up as well. So I think a lot of the formula there, but but certainly Mihailovic leads the way. Um, I love to see him get a spot um, on, on Berhalter's roster. I think the way that he's playing and the things that he can bring to the game, I think he'd, he'd be a valuable part of that midfield. It's funny you mentioned Nashville because that's who Montreal faces tonight in yeah. Nashville. I think it's the game of the, the night. Um, not just because Atlanta United will be in Nashville again on Saturday, and I would have been watching it anyway because getting ready for Nashville. It, it is a little bit of the Alistair Johnston situation because these two teams play similarly. They have they, they set up similarly, let me put it that way. They play a little bit differently. I think Wilfred Nancy is more attack-minded than Gary Smith is, but they start in that three-center back, two-wing back, two holding midfielder kind of setup. That, that's generally where they base off of. Montreal will get a little more creative with Mihailovic, a um, little more of that playmaker than Mukhtar, who's a little bit more of, of a goal scorer, I think, than, than Mihailovic. But you put those two guys kind of in a similar situation. And then what's different? I think the things that are different are, one, Joaquin Torres for Montreal has the potential to be a top player in this league and kind of flip things in terms of Montreal's ability. He's shown more of that to me than Aranda Leal has consistently with Nashville. And in that right side, because Montreal has Alistair Johnston, Nashville had him. Nashville now goes generally Miller or Mwil, and neither one is as good defensively as Johnston was. Mwil, I think, maybe gives you a little more going forward, maybe. But Johnston gives you both, and it allows Montreal to when they want to play Lassie Lapalainen, who is not a defender naturally, on the other side, to create overloads and get forward, out of the same basic idea of the way they play, Montreal has more variety than Nashville, and a lot of it is because of that trade. Yeah, and and again, it's, it's, 
it's one of those in the off season that I mean, my, my first thought was like, what an incredible pickup by Montreal, right? Like kind of what a steal. I, it didn't, to me, it didn't really matter what the cost was because I thought he was so integral. Like obviously Walker Zimmerman gets so much of the praise, right? Understandably so. But I thought yeah. Alistair Johnston was like a low key major part. He of, made them more dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was a great move by them. And, and now that you look back on it, I feel like it was, you know, one of the steals kind of of, of the off season, right? Like I, I put it right in line with, with, uh, Ilya going to, to LAFC, right? Like from, yeah. from sporting, like two, the two moves in the off season, that wasn't even a trade, right? Like they got nothing in, in, uh, uh, in exchange for that, for Ilya. Um, so that's even worse for sporting, but, uh, you know, I feel like uh, I feel like both of those were 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 massive additions for for their respective clubs. Sean Davis going to Nashville has had the potential to be that, too. and he's been really good. But I think the loss of Johnston has made Davis's impact in 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 kind of a way a little less as, as strong as it could be. Because personally, I don't even with Davis, I don't think Nashville is as good right now as they were at the end of last year. Yeah, I, I don't think they're as strong, and I think they have to figure out in the the summer window that right side. They've got to upgrade from Miller and Wheel over there. Yeah, and and that's the thing. I guess I guess that they must have thought they had the answer or the or you know Maybe. someone to fill in for Johnston, and and obviously that that's not happened. So, um, you know, they they do have to do that business. I think in that next transfer window. All right, since you mentioned Ilya and Sporting, let's let's pick up Sporting here. <laughs> what in the wide world of sports is going on there? I know that uh, seven seven goals on the board was the shocker. I mean, to basically everybody. What in the Sporting Kansas City Blue? You know what is going on over there? It's uh, it, it's a team that. I, I think what I think I feel like it's a situation where like you've had a system and a group of players that's worked so well for you, right? Like for years. And I feel like Peter Ramiz in this situation maybe held on a year too long. You know, maybe I don't know, two years too long with, with a lot of this group. He didn't mm-hmm. rotate the the roster, I, I don't think well enough or, or make changes. Um, and it's gotten, they've gotten old really quick, right? Like um, I look back at like Jalen Lindsay, for example, and he was the heir apparent and he was, he, you know, he was dealing with injuries as well, but he was supposed to be the heir apparent to Zuzi, right? And then you let him go to his hometown team, obviously the, with Charlotte. And then you still have Zuzi and he's not younger. Right. And now he's he's uh, dealing with injuries as well. So I. And then and then again, you let you get you let Ilya go for free. Now, he was an older player as well, but you don't replace that position. So they did with yeah. Roselle. I mean, they did bring him back. Mm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's just and uh, you, you know that Peter Vermes has earned the right to call his own shot. 100%. No doubt. But when you have moments like this, you wonder if that call is going to come sooner rather than later, though. Well, no, I think that's a little unfair, John, because it's not like Sporting Kansas City outside of the last 30 seconds when a video assistant referee and referee couldn't get on the same page. It's not like Sporting Kansas City wasn't the best team in the West last year. They were. So to say that all of a sudden he should call his own shot and walk, no, nah, that's not. I don't think that's fair. But he well, does well, have to answer to those. I think you have to hit the reset button. I agree. And and be like, look, th- this year is a loss, right? Yes. Now you do, 100%. Let's go, and, let's go to next year. And look, the Polito and Kenda injuries are a massive part of it. Yes, we, sure. we, we can't leave that out. You've lost two designated players, and, and it's very hard to deal with. Um they screwed up the sixth position that that to me is the biggest issue. And that's the one that Peter Vermes has to figure out what went wrong. What, where did he miscalculate? Should he have given Ilya more money? Cause he's making that call. You know, this is not your, your normal situation. It's Vermes making the call. 
I, I didn't even look uh, what Ilya was making. This was something we had talked about uh, leading into this moment where now we know the salaries. Uh, John, pull up what Ilya is making over LAFC real quick because I can't imagine it's something that Kansas City should have said no to. 1.15. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much what he made last year. I think he was right about one last year or maybe just under. You got to pay that. You got to do that, and then they'd Especially be better. For every day six that plays at yeah. his level. Yeah. Yeah. They'd be better even without Polito and Kenda. They wouldn't be what they were last year without those two. That I, I think that's fair to say. But they would be better if they had gotten that position right. Now you got to blow it up. Now you got to prepare. You got to make the decision is Caden Pierre at right back, who I really like, who's even younger than Lindsay, is he the heir apparent? Right. Did they bet right? They got to play him and find out. If they didn't, then they got to go get a right back as well. Um, the center backs, you know, you got to make decisions on it. Are, are we good enough here? You got to make a decision on Russell and Shallowy. I think Shallowy's in the last year of his contract. He's probably not coming back if they couldn't get a deal done with him prior to this. Uh, you might not necessarily want him to come back because he's very up and down. Can you commit large resources to that? Vermes has to look big picture now and punt on this year and plan for next year. And he's got to get those decisions right. If he doesn't, then we can have the conversation about time being up yeah. and, and needing to move on. But I don't think you can do it after a year where they should have won the West. Mm-hmm. Like they literally the last 30 seconds of the season on a blown call, they should have won the West. But yeah, I think, I think he, he's, he's earned enough equity right in yeah. in his position to uh now that that being said right if he doesn't hit the reset button mm-hmm. yes right like uh, any 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 keeps with this and and the kids aren't playing and the system maybe doesn't change uh and that's another thing too right like he's been so stringent on his system mm-hmm. and 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 those pieces fit really well in that system but you know, again, you know, it, is it a personnel? Is it a system? I think they've got they've got to they've got to go to the laboratory right now and and figure those things out, right? Get those beakers out and yeah. kind of figure out what to do going forward. Because you know, you've got you know Roger Espinoza seeing regular minutes, right? You've got Graham Zusi seeing regular minutes, and these are guys who are well beyond their uh, you know well into their thirties, right? So. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 super interesting to see sort of how how he approaches it you know does he does he uh dig in and and be like no this is this is what we're doing or you know is he flexible and does he change how he approaches it will define his future in my opinion if he doesn't approach it in the right way yeah his future might not be as long as it could be uh, Portland has been in the same situation and look, they're the ones who get it's seven goals in this one and, and take care of Kansas city. I don't think that changes Portland's conversation either. I, I think they have to look at the long-term big picture here and they, they don't have an injury to a nine and an injury to a 10 to really point at They're you know, three, three and six, 18 goals, four with seven in this one, uh, 18 against they are below where you would normally expect the Timbers to be. This feels like the year that I thought last year could have been, where it was the year too long for that group to be able to get things done. Does Portland have to have the same internal process about looking at? You know, I think I think if they didn't make that run last year, that I, I would say – you know, get, let them run their course, I guess. Right. Like if, if they don't make the postseason this year, then for sure, I would say you've got to hit the reset and figure things out there. But I, we were in the same, I feel like in the same part last year, right. It's like Groundhog's day. We were saying that they were the team that got old quick. They did. And then, and then, yeah, they made that fantastic run in the second half and into the postseason and through the postseason. So, uh, Again, equity wise, I think that they've earned enough where yeah, they have. Just let let you know, let it be. Let it let's see what's gonna happen and and uh and then, you know, judge them, I think, when the regular season ends. 
Now, I, I know this is blasphemy in, in some parts of the, the national soccer conversation, but I think we have to ask a question about what's going on with Philadelphia. They fair, are on, they're on 20 points. They have drawn four games in a row. They lost the one before that. They're 5-1-5. Five, and five. Um, They don't get a, a win at home over the Red Bulls, who have been really impressive on the road. They can't win a game at home, which makes no sense whatsoever, but – They've been really impressive on the road. But Philadelphia, after a really hot start, has come back to earth in a big way, and they've been passed at the top of the East. Is something wrong with Philly? Well, the first thing that's wrong with them is is they don't – all those draws that they have, almost all of them are from winning uh, – giving yeah. up, conceding winning. off of a, of a winning position. So that's, that's troublesome for them for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the number um, that was in uh, Opta today, which I, I love that the website is pulling the, the nuggets in on each of the matchups. I, mm-hmm. I love that because there's so many good pieces of information. And, and this is one of the ones that jumped out to me. 11 games this year, Philly has been has taken the lead in 10 of them, yeah. but they've only won half of them. Ooh. Crazy. Hmm. That's and, and 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 then I think if you if you peel that back even more, right? Like those were early, yeah. right? Like yeah, I remember I was on the call with Glenn Crooks at at Yankee Stadium where they got the goal early against NYCFC, and then they got one again, and that, and that was it, right? So like they they did their job there, um, they did their job in the early season, but but of late it's been, you know, let's they get a lead and then they concede, right? And Jim Curtin's kind of been like, like you look back to the uh, to the LAFC one, right, a couple weeks ago, where he's like, you know what, it's it's great, you know, we'll take the point uh, on the road. They took a point at Nashville, so like those are the positives you're getting results in the road. But then the other side of it, or or the glass half empty, is you could have gotten more, right? Like you should have gotten more. You have the lead in these matches. You have you. A, a solid team, right? A, a team that um, plays so well against the ball and and should be able to lock things down. And I think that's the, to me, that's the cause of concern for for the union right now. Last win was April 9th. Two losses and four draws since yeah. in all competitions. The team behind them right now in the East is Cincinnati, and it seems like you're gonna get one thing or the other. It's either Nobody a win or a loss. That coming. Yeah, and that's and that's what I was getting at. It's like <laughs> Dylan, you see, yes, it's either a win or a loss right now at Cincinnati, but Cincinnati fourth in the East. I mean, that is definitely the early season surprise is worth the one third mark. Hundred percent right, and uh, again, huge credit to to Chris Albright and and Pat Noonan and um, I, and also just the management, right? Like we were saying it, I think even before those guys were appointed last year that, you know, maybe it's time to get those MLS guys in, right? Like you've tried these other managers and, and, and it's clearly not worked, right? Uh, bringing guys in from the Netherlands and other, like, let, let's see what you could do in with major league soccer experience. Right. And the early returns are really good with that, right. Where it's guys who, you know, are from Philly and, and Noonan obviously played as well for, for so many years. Remember him, especially in his time with New England. Um, these guys are, 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 uh, they know all about MLS and, and, and how to win in MLS. So, um, credit goes to them and, and, you know, we, we kind of laughed earlier, but I don't think we could laugh anymore. Like Brandon Vasquez is having a hell of a year, right? And he, Mm -hmm. and he's, has a, great facilitator in, in Lucho Acosta uh, as well. And, and he's another guy too, who was, was a little bit cast aside early on by, by DC. And now he's, he's returned to his form and, and that we knew of him as one of the best playmakers in MLS. And uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's great to see early on, right? Like, can they sustain it? That's the big question mark, but uh you're right. I think early story, uh, biggest surprise, it's got to be Cincinnati. Now, 
there's two teams that have been hotter than Cincinnati in their last five. We already talked about one of them, Montreal. The other one's NYC. And four wins out of their last five, a, a draw mixed in there as well. After CCL ends for the Pigeons, they've been they've been killing it. What are you seeing about NYC that is different, or have they just really gotten back to who they were after a lot of games early on? <clears throat> I don't know if they're different. I think they're just uh, just better. Like it's kind of scary for everybody else because it's yeah. uh, it almost feels like. Ronnie Dyla is just like toying with thing. Like he's like playing FIFA and just like, all right, Maxi is a six. Let's see. Yeah. Saw that. I'm like, yeah, right. you got a five, three dude is your six. Yeah. All right. We'll play him as a six, you know? Oh, you know, we'll bring in, we'll bring in uh Pereira. Oh, we'll bring, you know, like there's so many pieces. There's so much depth. Uh, it's, there's battles for spots. It's, uh, you know, almost every position, I think with the exception probably of the outside backs, at least right now until Tinner Home comes back healthy, you could say there's at least two for every spot. And it's not like it's a, a drop off, right? It's almost like a like for like <clears throat> in those positions. Uh, so they're just a better version of themselves right now. And they're, and they're just slicing teams apart, right? Like you, you mentioned games to watch and and they're just like a fun they're a fun team to watch right now they're like they're for me they're kind of like lafc the supporter shield year right like like super fun to watch like atlanta at its best like with almarone and joseph and 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 uh you know all those guys like the neutral i feel like you've got to watch them just to watch them yeah, I feel like the guy who's maybe changed them the the most, he's a little inconsistent at times. Um, and he he's he's the second guy, Tylus Magno. But Santiago Rodriguez is ooh, he's legit. Yeah. He's really jumped forward this year. Keaton Parks has as well with with Sands gone, but I feel like Rodriguez is the one who makes them even more dangerous going forward. And that's the thing, right? Like so you you give him those keys at the 10, right? And yeah, so so you you're not saying Max you just to get off the field, let's find the other spot for you, right? Yeah. And if you control the play so much and this is something that we're we're seeing in Atlanta with the way they've they've shaped their midfield right now, people didn't expect Franco Ibarra and Mateus Sosetu to work as a a duo in the holding midfield. But when you control the play and you have the ball and you're dominating you can play an offensive player in a holding midfield spot because it even makes it easier for you to control the play yeah yeah no and uh and and i love to you know they they interviewed maxi after the match and like have you ever played this he's like no never have but you know like just whatever the manager wants and and uh positions are overrated the way the game's going i think the way that guys like dyla and 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 pineda and and I, i Chirondolo potentially still want to see more, but yeah, I think he sees it a little bit more broader. You know, it, it's a lot of it is, is what we've seen from Pep where guys move around as chess pieces and the position isn't as important as the function and what they're doing and what that player brings to the group. And Maxi, the, the interview with Dome Tarrant that I saw during the pandemic where Dome Tarrant was just raving about Maxi Morales just loved him so much and said he was one of the smartest players he ever had. When you have that soccer IQ, you can play anywhere. He could play center back if he had to. That would be fun. That would be fun. Uh, <laughs> you don't you don't want to get into the aerial rules with that, but I'm sure he would find a way yeah. to make it work yeah. because he's a smart yeah. player. And when you're controlling the play, you can do those things. Texas teams, really quickly. Last year, all three Texas teams below the playoff bar and they were pretty much right next to each other in the standings in the West. Right now, Dallas and Austin are 2-3. Houston is north of the playoff bar. And when, you know, we've been sitting here and wondering about Austin, okay, are you beating the teams that you're supposed to beat? Yes. Can you beat teams that are traditionally above your above your weight class and that kind of stuff? Dallas, with the talent that they brought in, Houston, new ownership group, and all the, the things that we're seeing there. So the Texas teams, all three of them, 
definitely 180 degrees from where they were last season. Are they? Uh, I, I, I think I, I <clears throat> if we're playing like the buy sell game, I think I, I certainly buy Dallas. Yeah, I buy Dallas a lot. In the order of buying, selling, I would go. I would go Dallas, Austin, Houston. I'm yeah. not quite sold yet on Houston. They're better, but, I think. Uh, they're not. It's going to take more time. Dallas, yeah. oof, they're they're a cup contender. They're they're a cup yeah. contender to me. And Austin, I, don't I, think I know finish three. I think they'll finish north. Of, I think they'll finish in the top seven. I don't. Think I don't know three. I, I honestly don't know. Um, I know they get very bent out of shape if you, you question Austin. They, they, they've referred to this on their social media. But I do. I, I, I still need to see more in the big games. And the Galaxy loss kind of, you know, it's like, hmm, okay. I'm not quite sold on Austin yet. And I want to see what Houston is when, when Herrera comes in, too. Like, does that really change things? It, it, not like that's going to be a big dynamic for them. Yeah, that's going to be a, a big potential change, and we'll see what that can do. Uh, anything else you're watching for specifically tonight, Dylan? Uh, I mean, how about just the potential for for just absolute madness with San Jose and Portland? Like, <laughs> what's going to happen There's there? Uh, 17 goals? <laughs> could, or it'd be Among? a scoreless draw. I mean, yeah, right. both are possible with these two teams. Um that's late night. LAFC Austin could be some MLS after dark too. Mm-hmm. Two Absolutely. high powered teams. Yeah, that's an that's a super interesting one. I think Vancouver Dallas could just be drunk. Yeah, over <laughs> over Vancouver over. Hey, they got two games without a loss, so maybe the Whitecaps are starting to turn things a little bit. This league's crazy, Dylan. That's basically what I've learned so far. There is no like I, I know I know there's the betting elements and and I know people who do I, I just it's I, dangerous I don't how you can bet man like, <laughs> it's dangerous in this league and we we supposedly know like you know we're we're in the know I, I like, <laughs> you don't know it's still dangerous it's you know, chaos um, thank you for being flexible this week on your schedule we appreciate it uh, thanks for rocking hey, me before I go though like yeah. so so who who won this 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 golf outing well we didn't keep score for Jarrett um, that was pretty evident on uh, the initial couple swings we weren't going to keep score I, I didn't want to do that um, I was keeping my score I don't think John actually kept his score but it was worse than yours I kept it it was <laughs> okay then it was worse than mine and I started really badly but I had a, a really good back nine so. It would yeah. have been me, I guess. Yeah, it was it was Jason, and Jason had an 18th hole for the ages. Let's put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, I I might have bounced one off a turtle to stay out of the water. Um, it's possible. <laughs> I think a turtle threw one of mine into the water earlier, so it balanced out. Very nice. Yeah, I'll take won. it. I'll take it. Uh, but thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for being flexible, and we will see you next week. All right, boys. Be good. Make sure you're following him, Dylan underscore Butler, on your social medias. What's up, Mike? How are you? Are you in Nashville already? No, I am on a uh, staycation before a vacation before work. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, I am. uh, We went golfing yesterday, first off, so. You know, trying to decompress after a crazy week last week and the week before for me. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, it's been a lot. But um, looking forward to getting up there this weekend and um, hopefully having a better result. Yeah, heading up tomorrow. You sound down. Are you, are you okay? I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just frustrated with things at work, but I'm good. Ah, geez, uh, not good. I, I hope you weren't frustrated with things that, that we're doing or things. No, from, no, of course from, not. Even not from ever. the Atlanta United universe. Not I was going to ask about that new grill, too. Oh, yeah, that's just... I mean, I'm excited about that. Yeah, right yeah. There. yeah, Leanne surprised me. Well, it's not really a grill. It's like a griddle, not a grill. It's everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm excited. I, I got to get the thing seasoned, so... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, probably stop at Publix tonight, get a whole big thing of canola oil, but... uh really really excited and yeah uh, uh i i see you're doing a brisket today that's awesome uh wc core that's great just be very patient with it don't try to do it too fast too hot or you're gonna end up drying the thing out 
But um, I think Will's pretty good with those things. Yeah, I, I, I generally, when Will is talking about cooking, especially in the uh, barbecue realm, I'll pay attention to what Will has to say. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'll be very anxious to see his pictures. And Sam, yeah, I see you on on the Blackstone. I, I, I kind of fell into this um, this little wormhole last night. Um, watching videos of like blackstone oh, recipes it's, it's uh, like its own uh, universe now i'm seeing people like making queso on a blackstone and uh uh making uh you know french red pizzas on a blackstone and, and these smash burgers these smash burgers look unbelievable so uh really excited to get it up and running uh before we head to nashville nice good stuff um let's let's look ahead to nashville uh one big surprise kind of yesterday is joseph martinez back in training for atlanta united uh gonzalo pineda said could be sooner rather than later i didn't expect that much sooner but it is Uh, i had no idea what that means for this weekend it is a lift to the team emotionally whether he is on the field whether he's part of the trip or whether it's just this is his first few days of training and they take it easy for him and maybe it's next week when he gets into the group but just getting him back into that mix is huge emotionally for this team. Yeah, and it's kind of like the first time this year that we've had a best-case injury situation play out because when this all happened, when Joseph went to to get his knee cleaned up, we were told that, at best, Joseph would maybe, maybe be back around the team by the time that Columbus match came around. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a little it, ahead. All right. Even there. a little ahead of that. Now, here's the thing. You're in a really good position right now as Atlanta United where it is an emotional boost, but you don't need to rush it. And yeah. that's yeah. the good thing. So, Joseph, you know, th- these are going to be some critical weeks coming up for Joseph Martinez. And I think for Atlanta United, too, there's going to have to be a pretty constant evaluation of Joseph and what the comfort level is in that knee, and if Joseph feels like he can push himself to the level that he needs to push himself to. Otherwise, Atlanta United's going to have to make a decision in the upcoming window. The the fact that he's back training now with the team gives you a couple extra weeks to make that evaluation, which is a good thing for the front office. So I know I'd be really, really surprised, very surprised if Joseph played on Saturday, but I would be less surprised if he was on the trip. And I think just having him around right now is a really, really good thing. Posatu has done an amazing job with the captaincy. Yeah, he has. I think he's done a fantastic job. I think he'd keep it too. If Joseph's back, I don't think Joseph grabs the armband. No, no, no. I agree. I agree. I do too. Uh, But again, just from an emotional standpoint, emotional leadership. Yep. Joseph gives you that uh, even without wearing the armband. So huge boost for Atlanta United. Huge. 100%. Well, and at the same time, Mike, you know, there's always that that self-expectation from Joseph is that, you know, he wants to get out there and he wants to be the best version of himself that he can be as, as a part of wanting to push, and I'll put that in quotation marks, so he can be as ready as possible. There's always that self-expectation from a competitor like Joseph to want to get back out there again. Yeah, and, you know, I think we heard it a little bit last year, John, how uh, even Heinze, I think, had said, like, they had to be careful to not overdo it with Joseph because Mm -hmm. Joseph really wanted to play, but they had to be really, really responsible about how much work they could give him coming back from that surgery. Yeah, and we didn't know at that time the complications. Heinze did, obviously, so it makes more sense in, in hindsight, but yeah. They, they had to be more careful. and But they, even without even without the complications, I mean, you almost have to save Joseph from himself a little bit. Like, yeah. Joseph's going to want to play, you know? And, yeah. And you've got you've to reset the expectation and, and make it clear to him, like, Joseph, yeah, that's great, and we want you to play, but we've got to do this the right way so you don't put yourself at risk of, of suffering a setback. And, and just for, for Kevin on the Twitch pitch, no, I am not saying Joseph may play on Saturday. I, I don't think he No, will. you're saying the opposite. I, yeah. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. But I do think there's a good chance he'll be around the team. Yeah, which I think is a really good thing. I, I think at best, at very, very best, you might be looking at him being in the 20 for Columbus. At the yeah. very best. Yeah, I think that's uh, possible. And, um, 
you know, that's that's still okay. I mean, we had been led to believe as recently as a couple weeks ago that Joseph might not be back until July. Yeah. So this is all a good thing. Like this is all good that uh, that he is very clearly ahead of schedule. But I I would be beyond shocked if he played on Saturday. Yeah, with this kind of a situation, and and I know with Atlanta's injury history, um, with the bad luck they've had with Achilles and an ACL tear with Ozzy this year, and all of that, I, I know there's a lot of armchair doctors and and trainers out there. This is not really anything that you can compare it to. This is really uncharted territory for the club and and for Joseph because. It's not, uh, there's, there's no real timetable on recovery from a cleanup procedure on a knee. It's going to be a lot of how he feels. It's going to be a lot of what he does in training and how it looks. It's going to be a lot of managing workload. There is an element of not letting him push too hard, too fast and, and kind of managing that. But there's not a way to sit here and say like, well, he shouldn't play until the Pachuca game or he shouldn't play right. until the first game after that or he, he should play this week. Like, there's no way to know. We're all guessing. And a lot of it is feel. And a lot of it, honestly, in this case, because it it's not surgery and then recovery, and it's a normal timeline like Emerson Hindman's was, where you ramp up his physical activity, and then you know where you can get. This is going to be, Joseph, how are you feeling? How is the knee? Are you having swelling? You know, can you, do you trust it? Can you push off? Can you sprint the way we want you to sprint? And he was doing that early the season. That was something Gonzalo Pineda talked with us about, you know, the sprint numbers, the amount of sprints he was making early in the season. He He's putting up pre-injury numbers. So that's why it was so surprising that then the issue happened. So we don't know. And you don't know. And nobody's going to know really except for Joseph. Well, one thing I do know is that Joseph's recovery has not been a straight line. No. Uh, no and that not. that's something to keep in mind, too. Like, you know, you hope this doesn't happen, but Joseph was with the team today. What happens if he reports discomfort tomorrow? And don't uh, be alarmed if he does. Like, exactly. That, that's that, the that's, thing. Is, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's part of the process. You know, so it, it would be... Right. It would be unrealistic to assume that Joseph is going to have a straight line to playing without any further setbacks. That's why, you you know, you, we all have to be patient. We all want to see Joseph, but we all have to be patient at the same time. I, I think, you know, the other piece of this is um, when Joseph is 100% back to full fitness and able to give you 90, <sighs> How do you line the team up? Yeah. You know, that's, I, that's I, easy. That's easy. Well, oh, yes, Jason, obviously. But, but, <laughs> but you do the rest with of it's the same. Okay. No, no, I'm just I'm saying like it's it's easy because he replaces Cisneros. Yeah, Cisneros no, doesn't but, replace Araujo or Almado or Moreno no, or anything I know, else. I know. I'm saying you could have the ability if you wanted to play a second forward up top. They won't. They, they haven't. I don't. To do that, when you when you walk that back, if you wanted to play Joseph and Cisneros together, you're not going to sit Araujo or Moreno or Almada. So then that's five. Then you're pulling somebody from Ibarra, Hosechu, Gutman, Dijon, Franco, Lennon, because you have to pull one to create the second forward. I don't think that's the route, even in three center back setups for Pineda. He didn't normally go two up top. He went more three, four, three. So as good as Ronaldo Cisneros has been, when Joseph is able to go 90, Ronaldo goes to the bench. And, and I think that's it. Um, now, late in games and, and subs in games, absolutely. Then things change because we've seen that where you go two up top, you sacrifice a defender, does that mean Gutman maybe tucks in? Do you sacrifice, you know, one of your fullbacks? Do you sacrifice one of your central midfielders? Play Hosechu by himself there when you're chasing a game? Then that possibility opens up in a big way. Yeah. And that gets really interesting. But from the start, 
you get too unbalanced to do that. And I don't think the the positivity would work out. I don't. You're not getting enough of an impact to, to get unbalanced. Well, and I, I also don't see a scenario where you're going to three center backs with the situation you have right no, now. You got to have uh, that extra cover, right? But I mean, you know, having the 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 luxury of a Ronaldo Cisneros and seeing what he's been able to do. You know, once again, you're getting back to that idea of everybody getting healthy and all those missing pieces coming back. And that offense, especially up top to what we were seeing with uh, Morena, Almado, Aruju, then you're possibly adding Joseph at some point. So that that offensive burst that I think a lot of folks were looking at is getting closer to being full. I think it is full. I, I think it already. I think you're enhancing full once yeah. you get mm-hmm. Joseph back. I mean that that's the scary thing for the rest of the league. Um, you, you know, if Joseph comes back to anything that he used to be, and you put Joseph on the point of that Almada, Aruju, Moreno, uh, and and I'll even go back a little further. Jose to Ibarra, yeah, at mm-hmm. back. Woo. Well, <laughs> include Gutman and Lennon in that because yeah, you have to. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely, yeah, you absolutely do. I mean that is. Um, <laughs> that's a front eight mm-hmm. that uh, is going to scare the pants off everyone in MLS. Now, again, Atlanta United's not going to be fully set up to throw a bunch of clean sheets with that lineup. Nope. Um, but, you know, for, for those of you who want to see this team win 4-3 as opposed to 1-0, you're going to get it. Uh, and it, it's going to be... But but the thing is, the luxury you have right now for Atlanta United, I do strongly believe this is where Joseph is right now. You're lucky that you haven't had that much of a drop off in Cisneros. Yeah, and I I do see Michael Head's comments. Cisneros didn't look as good Sunday. He didn't. He didn't. I agree with that. I thought he was at risk of being benched at halftime. To be totally honest, but we know what he's capable of doing. Uh, and, and that's the thing there, there's no unproven commodity up there right now. You know what you can get out of him and, and what I, what I like that he gives you even on a day where his, his runs. And I mentioned it multiple times on the, the commentary. I thought his runs off the ball were very poor on Sunday. I thought he was very indecisive in in his movement and it, it hurt the attack at times, but even on a day like that, he was outstanding with his work defensively off the ball. And that's the other side of this. That's not something that Joseph excels in. I I think you have enough around him to make that work when he comes back into the team. The press won't drop off a whole lot. But right now, the press is really important when it needs to be. And Cisneros is a huge part of that, even when his attacking side isn't as strong. But you look at, Ronaldo has been a a great addition. I've liked his work. Um, he's been an upgrade at the position in terms of a backup, but he's not Joseph Martinez. A- and you put Joseph Martinez and his intelligent movement off the ball, even when it's not a big sprint, even when it's not that, it's the little step one way, cut back the other. You know, the run to the the start to run to the back post and then hold at the penalty spot and wait for that service. Those kinds of things. You put that into this team. As good as the attack has been over the last month plus, that's an upgrade, and that's going to kick it up to another level. How you handle the pressing side with Joseph not pressing as much as Cisneros, because Cisneros is an animal on that side of the field, and it's great. But how you handle that will be really what makes this as effective as it can be. If if, if that means Hosechu is maybe more aggressive, like we saw on Sunday, where he was very aggressive stepping up high, and he bought her at that. Does it mean you have to get a little more out of Moreno in the press, a little more out of Almada in the press to, to make up for not having Cisneros and having Joseph? You're getting so much more in the attack, but that pressing element is something you can't forget either. So there's some, I guess, some rebalancing, and you got to build the chemistry because yesterday is the first training session that Joseph, Almada, Moreno, and Araujo had. Exactly. And just to be really clear again, Atlanta United is not rushing Joseph Martinez back. That is no. not occurring. Somebody starting a narrative? 
No, and well, I'm just seeing on, on the Twitch pitch, we're going to regret it if we rush him back. They're Nobody's not rushing him back. back. I right. promise you they are not rushing Joseph him back. Joseph would have been on the training pitch a month ago if, if it was his say. Right. Like, that's that's just how an athlete is. So yeah. nobody's rushing I'm, him back. Don't start with the training staff doesn't know what they're doing nonsense. Well, no one, no one has said that. Yeah. I know, no, one has said, no one said that yet. No, don't no want to see that, that get started. No, I, I don't either. Uh, because it's not true. It's just not. Uh, true. Yeah, I mean, again, look, you were talking about a procedure he had performed five weeks ago where the optimistic timetable was six to eight weeks. You're you're getting into week six. Yeah, just a um, little ahead. Yeah, he, he's pretty much on track. It, look, you know, I don't like talking about the, the money that these guys make, but we, we all saw the MLSPA report yesterday. Atlanta United's made a $5 million investment into Joseph Martinez. They're not going to do anything that would risk, um, you know, damaging and or ruining their investment. Right. No way. And they don't have to. <laughs> Again, that's the thing. They don't have to. Scored eight goals the last three games. They don't have to. So I, I'm I, I, I am of the mindset that Joseph is – Going to be around the team, getting himself fit, providing the team with some emotional leadership. But until he is 1,000% ready to go, and it's vetted by everyone that needs to vet it, Joseph's not going to play. And and there's no need to. No. Mike, let me go to the back line since we've talked a lot about the the attacking eight and it's uh, and what we see in it. And let me let me ask you about Alex DeJohn. Yes. And what we've seen from him, phenomenal. Yeah, coming into coming into the 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 spot that he has come into, and he has been nothing short of absolute money ever since he stepped out there. He's done a great job. I, I think I tweeted after the match on Sunday. In the last three matches he's played, and we're talking about seventy five ish against. Um, uh, well, in the, in the first match, 75-ish against, against Chicago, 120 against Nashville, 90 against New England. He, he's been in 28 duels and has won 18 of them. He's been in 18 aerial duels and has won 12 of them. He's gained possession 17 times. He has five interceptions uh, over about 270 minutes, give or take. Uh, may, maybe a little more than that, maybe closer to 300. That's really, really good. Um I think one other thing that's not coincidental, Atlanta United, you know, the recycled set pieces have still been an issue, but those initial serves into the, into the mixer on a free kick or a corner have been cleared with greater proficiency since Alex DeJohn started playing. And I don't think it's a coincidence because DeJohn – is someone who will go up and win aerials. 12 of the as I just said. He's aggressive and he attacks the ball. Doesn't change the fact that they're having some issues on recycles. Okay, but that's not all on Alex. That's communication and resetting. That's chemistry. Right, right. So um, I think he's done a phenomenal job. I think, again, let's keep in mind who Alex DeJohn is. I mean, Alex was brought in last year to provide cover at center back, basically be the fourth center back in the rotation. And he's playing like a guy that you can't take out of the starting lineup right now. Terrific job. When you have to rest him, okay, George Campbell steps in. Uh, but for now, he's he's your guy. Uh, in fact, I think... On the whole, he may be playing a little bit better than Alan Franco right now. On the whole, um, you know, Al Alan Franco, I think, caught a lot of crap for one mistake on Sunday that was easy to make, you know, where you, where you step up just a little bit too slowly to try to play a man offside. But I think for the most part, Alan Franco was really good on Sunday. I thought Alex DeJohn was extremely good on Sunday. Both have been good. I think where Dijon factors in in terms of the set pieces, it's not just the the stat of winning the aerials; it's the aggressiveness. Um, 
set pieces are about being aggressive. They're, they're about being decisive in those moments. They're, they're not out, out the initial set piece is, is not about the other stuff as much. You, you have the setup, you know what you're supposed to do. Ball comes into your zone, you go win it. If you can't win it, you make sure that the person who is going to win it in your zone doesn't have a clean look on goal, doesn't get an easy look on goal. I think those are the areas where Dijon excels. Um, the Franco mistake, you know, it is down to communication. He's late to step. Uh, is, is that something where, you know, is, is he organizing that? Is Alex, who's in front of him, organizing that? He really can't. It's something where, you know, I, I think Brad would have been. We know how vocal he is in, in organizing the back line. I don't think Bobby Shuttleworth is as vocal. So it, it's little things like that. Franco, Michael Head, does make you know mistakes, and, and it gets punished a lot of times. But that doesn't outweigh all of the good play that he gives you. The, you got to remember, and, and having the, the luxury that we've had this season of having Greg Garza and Michael Parkhurst on the show regularly on Fridays and two players who played on the Atlanta United back line at a time where they were as aggressive or maybe even more, probably about the same. I think Pineda does it a little differently, but the mantra from day one for those guys, and I think it's the same for Alan Franco and Alex DeJohn and anybody who's playing for Atlanta United now is you're going to be uncomfortable. Because we're not going to put numbers behind the ball. We're not going to sit back. We're not going to be defensive. We're going to get as many numbers forward as we can. So that means you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be 1v1. You're going to have to make split decisions. And you're going to have to get them right. And when you don't, people are going to yell. And there's going to be a lot of noise. Because it's going to look like it's all your fault. It's not all your fault. That's not how any of this works. But you're going to take the brunt of it. I think Alan Franco's got the personality to where he knows he made a mistake. He knows he was late to step. He knows he's going to want that back, and it's not going to affect him the next game. You want his mistakes to diminish. And I think for a while they did. Mm -hmm. Right now, you're getting even more aggressive getting numbers forward. I think it's the right play, and those mistakes at times get magnified. That's the trade-off you make. If you want to attack, you're going to have players who are forced into snap decision of step, go, cover, not cover, leave that guy, don't leave that guy. 2v1s, you're, you're going to be forced into those and you're going to get some of those wrong. And you might get punished when that happens. But that's the trade off for having wing backs or full backs in this case in a four that play like wingers. I mean, Lennon and Gutman spend more time in the attacking half than, than Hosechu does, you know, and, and any Botter does. And that's those are full backs. So <laughs> your center backs are going to get isolated and they're just going to make mistakes sometimes. Well, and again, I, I think, look, you have to consider the totality of Alan Franco's work. One thing that really impressed me was the the shift he put in um, at, at kind of playing wing back a little bit at the end of the Nashville match. Moved to fullback. He moved to right back yeah. because of what you had to do to try to go forward. He was good in that role. He, he did a nice job. <laughs> he did. He, he did a really nice job. And, and soccer for good OG, I, I'm with you. I mean, Alan Franco was doing a lot of great work last match. That's the unfortunate part of making a mistake that gets punished. That's what everyone locks on to. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it, it, I think Jason and I were talking about this on the full time report. It's like being a major league baseball umpire. You know, you, you see 200 pitches, you probably get 198 of them right, but everyone wants to zero in on the two you got wrong because they could be very, very impactful. Um, so, uh, you know, look, I think right now, if you're rating Atlanta United center backs, John and Alan Franco is your first choice center back pairing right now. I, I really do feel that. I think George is, is obviously in the mix, but I think George needs to take the spot away from one of them. Um, yeah. I, I, I really do feel that. Um, good situation to be in. And I, I, it goes back to John's initial point. It, this isn't an uh, indictment of Alan Franco. I think it's a testament to how well Alex DeJohn has played. He's done a great job. Yeah, when you look at the ratings on Sofa Score for the season, and look, it's less games for him, but Alex DeJohn uh, is fourth in the team. His performances mm -hmm. since he's come in have been that good. Now, that's that's purely statistical. Uh, that's, that's purely outputs. Uh, but he's been that good since coming in. George, I think, is the future starting center back for Atlanta United. That might not be right now, even if before everything happened, if he was healthy, 
when Miles went down, it would have been George. It's not, and that's sports, and it happens sometimes, and you're going to play Alex until George passes him, or Alex has a bad day, and George gets an opportunity, and then George keeps the spot. And Alan Franco's got to continue to fight for his spot. I think he's the the incumbent, and he will have it until proven otherwise. But you you have that luxury. Now you just don't have anybody behind them at the moment outside of Sosa when he can do it, or you have to turn to a Washington, or you have to go into the twos for a Noah Cobb or a Nelson Orgy, or you know you got to get creative. But you're to do what they've done. And I mentioned this, um, I think I mentioned it on the full-time report. I know I talked with with Dukes and Bell about it on Monday. To do what they've done with over this past month, losing the spine of the team, losing Joseph for a period of time, losing Alonzo, losing Robinson, losing Kazan. To be where they are, we talked about Sporting Kansas City losing Kenda and Polito and what it's done to them and losing a six because they didn't re-sign Ilya. Look what it's done to them. Look at how Atlanta United has battled and has played so well during yeah. it, even if the results haven't matched it. That's a credit to this coaching staff and honestly the front office for having a team with this kind of depth to weather that because most teams can't. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, every match where you can buy yourself a result gets you one step closer to July in the window opening. And that's a big thing too. Um, you know, that's why... Boy, if he can get a point on Saturday, that'd be huge. If he can get three next Saturday against Columbus, that's big. Now you're really buying yourself some time. You come back. Maybe you can find a way to beat Miami. I think that's a very winnable game at home. Um, you know, Maybe you find a way to sneak out a point or two on the road in New York City. And then you're at the window opening, and, and you can bring in the reinforcements you need. Just got to kind of tread water. And, and the good news is, by the time we uh, – um, you know, we, we get to the window opening, you're still a little less than halfway through the season. Mm -hmm. So you still have plenty of time. Um, so I'm optimistic. I, I think, you know, again, you look at the performances, you look at what the performances have been like since the Guzan and miles injuries. Um, they've been good performances, not perfect especially defensively not perfect, but good, exciting, entertaining. The match on Sunday, really fun, entertaining match. Loved it. Wish Atlanta United would have won, but didn't feel awful that they got a result from a trailing position in the second half either. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I'm with you. I, I, um, I think this team and the staff deserve a lot of credit, a lot of credit. Um, you just have to hope now, you know, pray that you have no other major setbacks between now and the opening of the window. Yes, that that's all I can do. Um, last question for you, Mike, uh, before I see you on stoppage time later today, uh, burned wanted to make sure you were calling the dream game on Bally on Friday because he's going to listen. And wow. Oh, thanks, Burn. Yes, I am. I'm excited. Uh, Dream playing great right now. They uh, blew out Indiana last night, so they're four and one. They play Washington, Elena Deladon. They're four and one. Uh, it should be a big Friday night crowd down in College Park. So I'm really, really excited for that one. Uh, and um, what did I say? Sam's upset at me for something. So I don't know. I um, think because of the the injury, you just mentioned the word injury. Yeah, that, that, it's just it's like no one's no one's going to get hurt because of something I said on soccer down here. God, I hate. I, that. I mean, we're influential. Just, we're we're very that, influential, Mike. Oh, that just annoys the heck out of me. Like, oh, you tweeted this, so now it's going to happen, or oh, you said this, and now it's going to happen. Like, we, 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 we've given a bump to teams no. like Defensa Justicia. They they benefited. They they yeah. acknowledged it. We we tried to give a bump to Binacional out of Peru. They didn't acknowledge it. They went down the hill. So this is a very influential program. Well, uh, I mean, I, I I hope I didn't influence anything negatively. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, uh, uh, we do have stoppage time, and um, you know we'll have a lot to talk about at two p.m. We'll kind of look back at New England. We'll look ahead to Nashville, and um, you know we'll we'll get into this Joseph story a little bit more. I know we've gotten some questions about Sosa. Maybe we'll get an update on that too. You want one more little nugget before you go? 
Go right ahead. The video that the team posted um, of who what everybody was picking for the NBA finals, who was going to win the NBA finals, and Miles uh-huh. Robinson uh, reveals his Boston Celtics jersey underneath uh-huh. him. Training, well, of course. He's a big Celtics fan, you know. He's a huge from, Celtics fan. Miles was a baller. He, we talked to him last year about that. He, he was yeah. a baller. Um, yeah. But in the video, a little bit of an Easter egg. Machope Chole in training gear, looking like he's heading out to train. Now, I don't know if he's with the team or not in terms of is he working with the team? Is he off to the side? But that's another one that we hadn't heard about in a while. Yeah. Chope was was out there making his prediction, and this was just done either this morning or yesterday. So that's good. good I mean, uh, that that's really good news. Love uh, to get him back in the mix. Yeah, and I, I think uh, Jack Collison would love to have him for a couple yeah. games as well. Yes, hundred percent. That would be big time. Hundred percent. Thanks, Mike. We will see right, you this afternoon for stoppage time. Sounds good. See you then. Be good. Jared, I don't have any music for you right here. And since I've been banned from using it. Yeah, you can't do it. No, in the, the human form. In the human how are you feeling after golf yesterday, Jared? Hurting. Man, both of y'all. First thing John says to me is like, oh, are you okay? You okay? He said your elbow was hurting after one of those those pitches out of the, the rough. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. You guys are both hurting. What's going on? I walked 60 yards at a time. <laughs> well, you did. I tried to like drive the cart to help you because you were hitting the ball 60 yards at a time. I couldn't control that part. Oh, that's true. I was trying to pick you up. You were like, no, I'm going to walk. Yeah, basically. Well, I'm just I don't want anybody walk. to think I just like drove off and left you. No, in, no, with no. The you, you offered multiple times and. I just I just chose to walk down the middle of the fairway. Harris chose to keep the same uh, well, club and hit it again. Well, hold on. Yeah. Middle of the fairway might not be always accurate, Jerry. I'm I, sorry. Could have, been, could have been the rough. Yeah. Oh, well, it, it's Trees. both, Will. It's, it, it's, actually, it's mostly physical. Like, Keep in mind, we went into this, and I went into this vocally as a, hey, this could get really sideways really quickly, but I don't have to work, so I'm just going to enjoy it. And I did. <laughs> I had a good time. Yeah, we we played pretty quick too. So I mean, it, it was it, Jarrett got much much better as the day went on. He he was finding the swing as, as we were wrapping up, which was good. Eighteenth eighteenth hole was great. Yeah, you played hole. it really well. You played the last few really well. Like you were finding it there, and and you'll be fine down the road. But when you have somebody who hasn't played in a long time, and it can slow a round down, but it didn't slow us down. We 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 played pretty quick. It was a good day out at Lake Spivey. Um, good core. I recommend it. Like we caught a really good Damn. deal on it. Generally, the the pricing is really good. If you're looking for a, a place to play that you can get through pretty quick, you're not going to get backed up. It's a good test. It's not like crazy hard. Um, you so can it's pretty play wide from, open. Yes. Yeah, pretty wide open. You can play from the back tees like John wanted to for some strange reason. I don't know why he wants to do this because <laughs> no, we're not going to ever do that again because or we don't hit be- the ball that far. Or you could be John on what was it? Was it the third hole that was the par three over the water where he hits it? He just lost an iron. It hits the came wood up short. It hit the, the wood, wood on the other side of the water and bounced all the way over the green, but gave him a good chip. <laughs> yep. It's yeah. just the most black magic. He couldn't have reproduced it if he had to. <laughs> yeah, well, like he got up like railroad trestles was... stacked at the edge of the water and it hits those trestles, bounces an unknown number of feet into the air and lands behind the green, like, like a bug's bunny shot. Meanwhile, Jason drops yes. one just over the wood where it hits. And I guess kicked into the water. I guess, I it guess is, it we lost just though. missed the sand. I think maybe a turtle went up there and got it and knocked it down. Cause we saw the it's turtles congregating. Yeah. I didn't see any geese that time. I think the geese probably employed the turtle because as we all know, geese are evil yes. and, and they, and they, they were yesterday. They're evil plotters, and I think they they probably paid the turtle off to to take my ball, and I was I was lost. But I think I bounced it off a turtle on eighteen to get it up uh, just over the water because I I saw a splash, and then somehow my ball is out of the water when we get up there. So I don't know how that happened. Um, it was very shallow water, so I mean there could have been a rock or something involved, like, or a turtle shell. I don't know. It was a fun day, anyway. Yes. Basically, is what it comes down to, and and now I've learned that. Uh, John can't talk to anybody else's golf ball. That That's was true. one of the first things I learned. He's yes. first hole. He's telling mine, uh, first tee shot. I, I didn't fade it. I sliced it and he's telling it to come back and it's 
coming back in. Not only did it not come back. <laughs> no, it came. No, it came back. No, and that's the thing. Is he's telling water. it to go somewhere into the water, mm-hmm. and it's like, uh, dude, what are you doing, man? Don't talk right. to my golf ball ever again. So that was one. Two, uh, Jarrett at different points in his swing as he was trying to find it. Uh, my expert opinion and advice was don't do that effed up thing that you did in the middle of it because I don't know what to call it that he did. It like looped or you hitched or you, I, I don't know what happened, but it just got weird in the middle there. And when it's you stop doing that, you're good. Well, it's also the fact that both of my shoulders and my elbows are double jointed and hyperextend really That's easily. So no it's problem, really yeah. easy for weird things to happen. It's the same that, thing when yeah. I throw a baseball, everything just turns into basically a spider's limb. Yeah. There, there were things that did not make any sense as, as I was trying to figure out what went wrong. And I, all I could say was don't do the effed up thing that you did. Yeah. That's all I had. Um, and what did I learn about myself on it? Um, I learned that, huh, what did I learn? Learned um, that it takes you 16 holes, but then when you actually hit the drive perfectly, you strut down the course. I uh, That drive, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll strut. I have no mm-hmm. problem with it. I have no problem should. with the, the drive that I hit that was about, 280 frozen mm-hmm. rope over sand Absolutely. in the middle of the, the fairway. Uh, yep. Best drive I've hit in years. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll do that. I chipped one in um, from off the green. That was cool. I, I got my chipping back where I wanted to by the end. I, I was good on the back nine, but I, I learned that I have to get locked in and focus on the golf course. And that's why I like to play golf because I block out all the other noise and, mm-hmm. and just get into it and play. And it helps. It's good. It's very therapeutic. If you like the golf, you know what that means. If you don't, you're probably like, what in the blue hell is this guy it, talking Imagine about? having to feel like you have to lock in and getting on a course with John and myself. Well, it was that's why the start was very bad because I was not able to lock in and it took a while. John told my golf ball to well, do bad things. And John and also tried to, to drive to like the 10th hole to start. That is also true. John just disappeared over a bridge and was off, and we thought we were going to lose him for the day, and we hadn't even hit a ball yet. Um, that that happened. That did happen. That's true. Now, for me, it is three wood until further notice because with these new clubs, I'm swinging my old speed with new clubs, and it doesn't quite work. And, and can it also be not playing from the the back tees? Can you, I wasn't can I wasn't playing that? from the blacks. I was playing. From, I wanted to play from the blues. You wanted to play from the the fourth tee box of the five. Um, can you not do that, please? Especially if you're going to hit a three wood off the tee. Yeah, that would kind of be pointless. Well, there was there were holes where my three wood was uh, actually going straight, and that was you know a novel thing for me. <laughs> just, so. just don't play from the further back tees when you're not hitting it that far. And Bart, you don't the reason need to. It's, There's no the, benefit to it. Bart, Bart, the reason it's golf down here is because people wanted feedback on how they chaotic did. this day would be. So they did. You can blame everyone else for asking questions and asking for a, a, a feedback on how stupid this day was, and there will be more days like it. Yes. It, Bart, you've listened to the show long enough that you know that sometimes it's golf down here, college football down here, cooking down here, music down here, who knows what down here. Mm-hmm. Uh, welcome to, to SDH. Um, we do have a Wednesday whip around to get into, but first, John has to tell everybody about our good friends over at Eliminize. I could certainly do that. QR code over my left shoulder for those of us watching on Twitch. For odor free, clean, fresh air, one place you need to go, and it's Eliminize service. You go to rising in closed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. They've created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, like pet cigarettes and food. Realtors and property managers use it. To eliminate bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. It's a turnkey process, makes it easy to work with said realtors and property managers. Kind to the environment, we like that these days. Very green way of going about things to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever. Different than our favorite masking agents under the sink because when we take out that masking agent, spray it in the air, all you're doing is masking the odor. You're not attacking the problem like Eliminize does all the way down to the molecule with their proven scientific formula. Pricing easy, one of two ways, either by the cubic foot or parts per million to come up with a price that's affordable for you, offering results in 24 hours or less. If you have any questions, frequently asked or otherwise, go to the website, eliminize.com, but do us a favor here at Golf Down Here. After the .com, go slash Atlanta, 
so they know what part of the world that you are contacting them from. So your homework assignment, E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com slash Atlanta, Eliminize dot com slash Atlanta for odor free, clean, fresh air. Eliminize service, proud sponsors of everything on a whoop around Wednesday, SDH. Nicely done. A little bit later than normal. Hopefully, the people getting ready for the whip around, whip around. will uh, sign up for Eliminize and check it out. All right. We got pretty much a full schedule. Not everybody playing tonight. Obviously, Atlanta United not playing tonight. But uh, lots of games. According to MLS, this is week 12. According to MLS Fantasy, it's not. No. It's combined with the weekend because why be on the same page in two different sections of the organization? I don't know. Let's get started. D.C. hosting New York City, 7 o'clock tonight at Audi Field. New York City's won four of their last six against D.C. United. Last time they played 6-0 in October to NYC. Uh, Largest margin of defeat in D.C.'s MLS history going back to 1996. Uh, New York City's won four of their last five. A draw was the other one. All of those were played at home. That was five in a row at not just Yankee Stadium, sometimes City Field. And they four one four or five. NYC has won just two of their last sixteen regular season away matches, going back to last July. Taxi Funtas scored the first goal against Miami, assisted on the second. DC since Taxi Funtas arrived, DC has scored seven goals. Taxi scored five and assisted on the other two. Good grief! Uh, Tyler's Magno and Valentin Castellanos have scored NYC's uh, two goals against Columbus on Saturday. Here's a weird one for you. 21 goals for New York City this season. Brazilians and Argentines have combined to score 15 of the 21 this season. That They love the South America, and they've somehow brought Brazil and Argentina together in New York. It, it is very impressive what Ronnie Dyla is doing. What are the numbers here, John? DC is a plus 241, and this is courtesy of our friends. At about- home, plus 241. Yep. Uh, courtesy of our friends in the composite odds portal, your draws a plus 265. NYCFC is a plus 104. Plus 104, a road favorite mm-hmm. by a wide margin. Jarrett Smith, what do you think? Uh, in DC is going to catch these, uh, these blue pigeon shaped hands, is what's going to happen. What's a pigeon shaped hand? I don't know, but they're pigeons, and uh, they are going to throw hands, and DC is going to have to catch ah, those hands. Okay. Um, are they like talons, or, or are the the act? I need to know. This is very important. Are they throwing talons like a pigeon would have, or I think it's more of a are wing. they throwing fists that are shaped like the whole pigeon? That honestly has a very Hitchcockian, you know, we want to traumatize Tippy Hedren some more yes. kind of energy to it. I yeah. just need the the explanation. You said it. Okay, let's 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 say they're talons. actually throwing literal pigeons at them. They're throwing like pigeons attached to their hands. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. what I wanted to know. And 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 you know who's going to stop them? Not you. Not me. Not anybody. Taxi Funtas? No, Taxi Funtas ain't going to stop them. Taxi Funtas might score a goal or two. He might. Right. But like this is this is the same equivalent of like you know that one defender holding the wall at Helms Deep. Like yeah, you might have taken out a couple of orcs. He didn't stop the whole invasion. Taxi Funtas might score a goal or two, but he ain't going to stop the whole invasion of of New York. So New York City wins in, in your mind? Yes. Okay. John, what do you have? New York City wins in my mind. Yeah, I think New York City wins. I, I don't believe in D.C. that much against New York City. Uh, Red Bulls hosting Chicago. Red Bulls came from behind to beat Chicago in April. Uh, Red Bulls have won two matches against Chicago in a single regular season only one time since 2008. So numbers say that Chicago would get this win at Red Bull Arena. Numbers would also say that because the Red Bulls have not won a match at home this season, but they have not lost on the road because the Red Bulls don't believe in, in, in anything resembling logic. Uh, if the Red Bulls do not beat Chicago, they would be just the seventh MLS team in history to go winless in their first six home games of the season. Remember, they're the third team in history to win your first five on the road. Again, no logic in Red Bull land. Chicago, they haven't won in their last seven. Uh, Five losses, two draws. They've lost their last four in a row. They've had four losing streaks of at least five matches in MLS history since 1998. Most recently, they lost eight in a row in 2018. 
Uh, no team has faced fewer shots than the Red Bulls this season. Opponents are averaging just 8.4 shots per match. Uh, Red Bulls have had 43.2% of the possession, but they've outshot their opponents in 10 of 11. The only team they didn't was against another team who doesn't like possession, Philadelphia, who did have the possession against Red Bulls. Philadelphia outshot Red Bulls 17-10 in that one. Chicago's got eight goals, lowest scoring team in MLS this season. They have scored with a league worst 6% of their shots this season. Uh, three of 76 shots have found the back of the net since the start of April. That's shockingly That's basically bad. Basically a million dollars for, uh, for per goal with uh, Shakiri's salary this year, basically. That's a wild step to try to make things fit, but uh, I don't even think Shakiri scored those three goals, so I don't even know if he assisted on them. So I don't even know if you do get the benefit of that. Um, Shakiri's getting paid a lot of money. He's got not a lot around him to play with yet. Although Jairo Torres and Chris Mueller have just showed up, maybe, possibly, allegedly, not yet. Red, what are the the numbers between Red Bulls and Chicago? Oh, uh, Red Bulls were a minus two hundred four at home. Your draws a plus three nineteen. Chicago is basically a plus six hundred. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, John, what do you have? Red Bulls. <laughs> they haven't won at home all year. I think they'll they'll break that Schneid. I think they'll win at home. Okay, Jarrett. Uh, Red Bulls. Sorry, El Mata Flow has turned it into uh, two linguistics down here with the Argentines and Brazilians not understanding Caribbean Spanish. Um, oh, yeah. no, That's, that's a whole different conversation that we're not going to start. Um, uh, Red Bulls, because I think they get their first win here. They're going to go and do a lot of teams have done a Red Bull Arena, which is like sit back deep. But they already showed that they can't really stop runners against Atlanta when they want to sit. Um And they just don't, I don't think they have the firepower. I'm going to go draw. I think it's a horrendous match. I think it's a scoreless draw and awful and not fun. And uh, don't watch it. There's plenty of other good games to watch. Don't watch Red Bulls in Chicago. Just don't. Your eyes will bleed. Don't do (laughs) it. Philadelphia and Miami also might make your eyes bleed. Uh, 7.30 tonight in Chester, PA. Philadelphia beat Miami both times in 2020. They did not beat Miami at all in 2021. A draw and a loss. Miami won 2-1 in Chester in April of 21. One of three visiting teams to win at Philly since the start of last season. New York City's got two of them. New England's got one. And Miami's got the other. Uh, Union scored first. We talked about this earlier with Dylan. They scored first against the Red Bulls. They conceded 10 times out of 11. Philly's taken the lead. Union have only gone on to win half of those. Five wins, four draws, one loss. Their 11 points dropped from winning positions is second most in MLS this season. Miami's got one point in three following winning three in a row. Uh, The one no win at Seattle during that streak, only points away that Miami's collected this season. Daniel Gazdag got the goal against Red Bulls on Saturday. He's been involved in at least one goal in eight of his last 10 MLS appearances. Gazdag has been outstanding for Philly. Miami's second goal against D.C., Damian Lowe, assisted by Jean Mota, was the first goal that Miami has scored in MLS since April 2nd that did not involve Leonardo Campana. Campana, five goals, two assists on Miami's previous seven goals, including the opener on Saturday. What are the numbers? Philly, Miami. Philly is in the room at a minus 222. Your draws is a plus 344. And inter Miami, a plus 592. <laughs> <Derek>. <laughs> Philadelphia. Philly hadn't won in five. Yeah, Philly can't hold a lead to save their lives, I know, but I think they'll build enough of a lead to do it against Center Miami. Okay. John? I think it's going to be another 1-0 game that'll make your eyes bleed, but I think Philly gets it. Draw. I'm going draw. Another one. Ugly. That's not, out of, that's not out of the realm of possibility at yeah. all, and I, that was very close to that myself. I just think Philly's going to get one too yeah. many. Yeah, I figured Campana might get the goal for under Miami, and it'd be a one-one draw. But I'll go. No. Hey, no one else is yeah. except for Damian Lowe. Um, I'm yeah, I'm not trusting Philly right now until they show they can do more than just disrupt. And right now, I feel like that's what they're doing outside of Gazdag. Uh, we'll see who wins the Julian Carranza Derby. I will see if he plays. I, you know, he's loaned from Miami to Philly. Um, 
I have not seen anything from anybody about a clause in the loan saying that he cannot play. We asked about it last year when it came to, to Gutman with Red Bulls, if that was an MLS policy or if it was deal by deal. And we were told it was deal by deal. So I, I don't think it's a blanket policy in MLS that an intra-league loan, you don't play against your parent team. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they had had that, but we were told they didn't. Um, that that was the agreement between Atlanta and the Red Bulls last year. We'll see if Philly and Miami have that because if Miami and they're sometimes, although this group in the front office seems to be better than the previous, sometimes front office incompetence. If Julian Carranza has a hat trick against Miami tonight to beat them, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Minnesota hosting the Galaxy 8 o'clock tonight. Minnesota unbeaten in their last two against the Galaxy, a win and a draw. They lost six of their first eight against the Galaxy all time. Uh, Minnesota's lost three straight, though. Um, they opened the 2021 season with four straight losses. Minnesota has lost five of its last seven league games after going unbeaten in its previous six, dating back to the end of last season. The Loons like to go streaking. The Galaxy conceded three times in their first 23 minutes against Dallas on Saturday. They had conceded four goals in their previous seven games. Fastest from kickoff that the Galaxy have conceded three goals in a home match since 2010. Robin Ludd scored Minnesota's lone goal in their loss to Seattle on Saturday, his fourth goal of the year. He's got 13 goals since the start of last season for Minnesota in MLS play, six more than anybody else. And he is far from an attacking striker guy you would expect to be scoring six more goals than anybody else on your roster. That's a bad thing. Uh, there's been a total of just two goals scored in the Galaxy's last three away games by both teams. Uh, one, one, and one for the Galaxy. They got the one nil win over Austin their last time out. They haven't kept consecutive away clean sheets in nearly three years. Do they do it tonight against Minnesota? What are the numbers? Numbers for Minnesota are a plus 143, your draws a plus 254, and LAG is a plus 175. Jarrett? Um, ugly draw. <clears throat> ugly draw. I John still does. think LA gets kind of weird scoring goals at times, and man, Minnesota's just kind of Minnesota's just kind of Minnesota. They are. Minnesota is Minnesota. Yes. 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 Ugly midweek draw. I'm with Jarrett. Galaxy win. Minnesota's uglier, I think, and I think it's one nil or something of of that ilk. I don't think it's a fun one. Uh, I think. Is Inchi going to be mad again? Probably he'll he'll probably say some things about I don't like to play these guys blah 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 and and you know maybe he'll actually be on a hot seat at some point probably not Houston hosting Seattle eight thirty tonight Dynamo snapped an eight match losing streak against Seattle last time they met and Houston won that two one in October uh, Houston has never won consecutive matches against Seattle <laughs> never <laughs> going back to two thousand nine when Seattle came into the league. Um, However, all six of Houston's wins over the Sounders have been in Houston. This match is in Houston. Uh, Dynamo had lost three in a row. They beat Nashville 2-0 on Saturday. Home field advantage for the teams from Texas. Austin, Dallas, and Houston have lost one match of 17 against teams from outside the state. That was the Galaxy win in Austin. They have beat each other, but... Only one loss from a team outside of Texas uh, happened to a Texas team this year in Texas. Crazy. Seattle, uh, three games in a row they lost in league play. They broke that with the win over Minnesota. They have not won consecutive games in MLS since a four-match run in September, October last year. Uh, Dynamo, don't get into the attacking areas very often. 97.6 passes in the attacking third per match this season. 27th out of 28 teams. Miami's the only one that has less. 16.1 touches in the opponent's box. 28th out of 28 in MLS this season. 5.73 shots inside the box per match. 27th out of 28. Toronto has the lowest number there. Oh. Raul Rui Diaz and Nicholas Ladero both scored for Seattle against Minnesota. 11th time both have scored in the same match for Seattle. The only duo to have scored more times in the same match since Rui Diaz joined MLS is who, Jared? 28, July 2018 is when Rui Diaz joined MLS. 
Only most duo to sent, uh, most on, duo. On, Only duo to have more games in which they both scored. Ooh. Um, LAFC, Vela, and... Um, hmm. uh, Rossi? Ding, 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 ding. Jarrett is the winner of the trivia today. Good job. Nice. 13 times. Good work. Nice. So you get to pick first. Ah, damn it! That's not fun. That's not a. That's not a prize. <laughs> that's not a prize. I'll, I'll give you a bag of golf tees next time we play. <laughs> golf balls for the ones I'm losing. Oh yeah, I probably um, need to buy you a case of golf balls. That's okay. Uh, I need to. I need to buy a John one <laughs> for the <laughs> ones that I lost true. for him. Um, give me. Um, no, give me Houston at home. Close, ugly, like decided on a penalty kind of game. Okay, John. Ugly midweek draw. Is anyone else surprised by that? No. Houston wins. Dynamo, first time, back-to-back wins over Seattle. I think Dynamo get the win. Twitch pitch disagrees with us. That's fine. That's okay. That's fine. It's not the first time. It won't be the last. Nope. Uh, Sporting Kansas City, Colorado, 8.30 tonight. Colorado had went six without a win over Sporting Kansas City. They beat them in Commerce City in March. Uh, Colorado have won four times out of 30 trips to Kansas City since 2000. Four wins, six draws, 20 losses in Kansas City. Uh, Sporting Kansas City, the only team in MLS history since 1996, only team ever to concede seven goals in a match more than once. Yep. And they did it for a third time on Saturday. Not a second time, a third time in their history. Nobody else has done it more than once. Uh, They did it in 2019 against the Galaxy and in 2001 against Chicago. Uh, Rapids at home, 22 straight without a loss. Um, They're not at home here. They have one point from five away matches this season. Uh, Going back to last October, they've lost seven of their last 10 away from home, including the last three in a row. Uh, eight goals in the second half for in Sporting's loss to Portland on Saturday equals the MLS record for most combined goals in a half. And I actually watched this game. Kansas City helped set it. Fourth MLS match ever for Kansas City. 6-4 win over Columbus in May of 1996. It was a Thursday night game on ESPN2, I think, in 96. I watched it in my dorm at UGA. Mo Johnston made his debut for, for the Kansas City Wiz at the time. Nobody beats uh, Bo O'Shawnee was the goalkeeper for Columbus. Uh, digital Takawira scored and did the digital crawl. Yes. I think Mo Johnston had a couple of goals. It was 6-4, and it was beyond stupid. And I'm <laughs> like, I love this league, and, and that's why I'm still here. So they were part of that. Uh, what are the numbers for in Kansas City, Colorado? Kind of uh, juice box purveyors don't really have a whole lot of thought either. How are you supposed to know after Sporting gave up seven and Colorado's awful on the road? Yeah, Sporting's a plus 170. Your draw's a plus 225. Colorado's within the margin of error at a plus 163. Uh, uh, There's no read on either one of these teams. So, John, you have to pick first. You're picking a draw. Uh, I was going to actually pick Colorado. I think. Why are you going to pick Colorado? Sporting's broken. I'm picking a draw because I think they're both bad in yeah. the situation. I, I think Colorado's bad on the road, and I think Sporting's just not very good right now. Nice. I do think Sporting, they you can say they're broken. Uh, Peter Vermees might have broken some bones um, on some individuals, yeah. and maybe he's threatened to break more if they don't have a better performance, and sometimes that's enough. Uh, I think they'll be better. They're going to be professionally embarrassed about giving up seven in Portland. And I think they do put up a good fight. I just don't know if it's good enough to win. I'm going draw Jared. I'm going Colorado. Um, Jesse's artist tour revenge tour continues. And I think they're going to take a little pep in their step after what they did to LAFC. Granted that was at home. Maybe they'll bring the plague prairie dogs with them, but I think they, they got a little, they got a little mojo. I feel like there's more draws in these midweek games yeah. than, than usual just because it's tough. Um, and yeah, this you, is really the first extended one. Yeah. Get a little pragmatic in those midweeks. You don't want to burn the fuel for the weekend. You're thinking about the weekend. You're thinking about the previous weekend. I'm, I'm leaning more draw heavy right now because of that. Uh, Nashville, Montreal is one that could definitely go draw. Uh, Nashville has never lost to Montreal ever. Two wins, two draws. 
Uh, both wins were in Nashville. Um, Montreal is the only MLS team to make uh, multiple visits to Nashville um, without losing at least once. Wait a minute. This is confusing. Um Oh, both wins came away from Nashville. Sorry. Uh, Nashville won one time in Montreal and one time when Montreal hosted in New Jersey. Remember the craziness of 2020. Uh, Both of the draws were in Nashville. Okay, my bad. I screwed that up. So Montreal has not lost at all in Nashville. They're the only team to to visit more than once and not lose. Nashville has not lost in 21 games at home. Um, 10 draws out of that, though, 11 wins, including playoffs. This goes back to November of 2020. Uh, Nashville has scored in each of its last 17 home matches. That's impressive. Montreal, club record unbeaten run is now eight. They got the win in Charlotte, who had been very good at home. Um, Six wins, two draws in this run right now. Third straight win, 20 points from eight matches. How many points does Montreal have this season, John? Montreal this season has uh, 20. 20. They've got 20 in their last eight. They did play games before those eight, yes. and they didn't get any points. That's yes. why it's crazy they're in first. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, most it's ever collected in an eight-point, eight-match eight stretch in club history, 20 points. CJ Sapong has not done well against Montreal in his career. 22 games against Montreal in CJ Sapong's career. Two goals. Mm. 0.12 goals per 90 minutes played against Montreal. Second lowest rate he has against any team he's played more at least 10 times. He's worse against Seattle. That's it. Georgia Mihailovic, sixth goal of the year in Montreal's win over Charlotte. Already a career single season best for him. 10 goal contributions, six goals, four assists, tied for the most in MLS this season. I think he's tied with Jerusi of Austin. What are the numbers on Nashville, Montreal? Numbers on Nashville and Montreal. Nashville's a minus 105. Your draws a plus 236. And to see if Montreal possibly impact later on are a plus 303. Montreal. <laughs> yeah, I figured you see that plus 303. You're like, yeah, buddy. Gimme Montreal. Too good of a team to have a, a plus 300 on, on their name. Montreal taking it, running with it, buying the lottery tickets, leaving yeah. right now. Yeah. Jared, what are you picking? Oh, Montreal. Um, yeah, that number's too good on top of the fact that, yeah, Montreal went in. They probably should have beaten Charlotte by more than they did. Uh, that was that was Kalina making a couple really good saves, and um, you know Jordy Mihailovic is should be your in the clubhouse MVP leader right now. Nashville wasn't great against Atlanta in that first half, and they came out in the second half of the Open Cup. We don't have to rehash that. They didn't do much better on the weekend when they went on the road, were up a man for sixty five minutes, and gave up another goal and lost two nothing. It's a yeah. Nashville's getting their home games, but it's tough because they're getting them, you know, crunched together a bit at home. And until they can put together a competent first half, I'm kind of giving them a side eye, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, look, they they played 120 against Atlanta. They looked worse. They had one less day of rest, but they looked worse on the weekend than Atlanta did. They then went to Houston, not exactly an easy place to go and play, and they didn't do well there. Now they go back for a Wednesday game. Part of it is I'd love to see Montreal wear Nashville down even more because Atlanta doesn't play in the midweek, and then they get Montreal on the weekend. So I am biased, yes. but I do think Montreal's a really good team. I think they're the best team in MLS right now, and I think they get the win. Uh, what are you picking, John? Same, Montreal. That's yeah. a strong reason. Yes. Well, uh, A, first and foremost, north of plus 300, but then all of the evidence that has uh, been presented by uh, the two of you previously. I am in lockstep agreement with all of you. Fair enough. Uh, Vancouver, Dallas, 10 o'clock tonight. Vancouver, unbeaten in their last four against Dallas. Uh, 1-0 home win the last time out. They've never won consecutive games against Dallas, though, ever. 25 times they have played. Vancouver's unbeaten in back-to-back games, first time this year. Uh, 3-3 draw with San Jose on Saturday. Drunken madness, mess, maple syrup flying everywhere. It's insane. Uh, Draw marked the fifth time in 10 that Vancouver's allowed at least three goals this season. Oof, that's horrendous. Uh, Speaking of scoring three goals, Dallas scored three in the first 23 minutes against the Galaxy. Uh, Fastest from kickoff, Dallas has scored three goals since 2006. Uh, Vancouver's last eight goals including all three against San Jose, were in the second half. 
two first half goals this season, fewest in MLS. Um, oof. 13 of Dallas's last 16 goals, including all three against the Galaxy, have been scored by Americans. No other team has more than eight goals from U.S. based players this season. So, NYC, they've created the Argentina Brazil Pact of Doom. Dallas, all American, baby. <laughs> what are the numbers? Uh, Vancouver's a plus 206. Your draw's a plus 241. FC Dallas is a plus 129. Road favorite. Road fate. Well, Vancouver's been bad. Uh, Dallas has been very good. Uh, Jarrett, what you got? Um, you know what, Dallas, whatever. I shouldn't have <laughs> thought about it that long. You know what, Dallas, whatever. That's the, the kind of analysis that you don't get on many programs. It's you know what, we're, we're just here to provide entertainment. I, you know, I try to provide more than entertainment from time to time. It, it, it's something we try to do, you, you know, but it's okay. Uh, John, what is you it got? though? No, it's not. Okay. What you got, John? I'll go draw. Dallas is 1 1 and 3 away from home this season and going to a traditionally a tougher place to play at BC Place. So I'll go draw. Dallas win. Uh, I think they're just a better team. Uh, I think they are growing up a little bit before our eyes. Uh, I think they get it done here. And right now, if you told me MLS Cup was Montreal, Dallas, I would not argue with you. Mm -mm. I would not argue with you at all right now. One team that will have something to say about that is LAFC, and Austin might have something to say about that. They meet at Bank of California tonight at 1030. LAFC has won, or they won all three matches with Austin last season. Um, LAFC lost in Colorado on Saturday. They had went 18 straight games with a goal. They did not score in Colorado. Uh, they have scored in their last 31 home games. Longest active streak in MLS. 31 straight home games going back to August of 2020 that LAFC has scored in. Austin, back-to-back -back losses. They'd only lost one of their first nine. Um, they only have two wins in their last 19 games on the road in MLS. They haven't managed a clean sheet in their last 15 away. So you got the longest active home scoring streak against a team that hasn't had a clean sheet on the road in 15. Hmm. Yeah. LASC conceded two first-half penalties against Colorado on Saturday. First penalties that LASC had conceded in MLS play since October of 2020. 46, <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, forty-six <laughs> match run without giving away I got, a penalty. I have questions. I have, I have, I have questions. Forty-six match run without giving away a penalty. Longest run in MLS history. If two LAFC had it. What are your questions, Jarrett? Would you like to Ra share them? Rangers and Celtic think that's a little bit extravagant. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Maybe that's a black helicopter I see off in the distance. Diego Fagundes, he moved to the top of the MLS assist chart, seventh of the season on Saturday, set up Alexander Ring. Fagundes has recorded more assists in a single MLS season only twice in his career. He had 10 in 2018. He had eight in 2017 with New England. Fagundes is killing it. Austin, not killing it on the road. LAFC, very, very good at home. What are the numbers? Oh, there are numbers. LAFC is a minus 208. Your I draw. certainly hope so. Yeah, that would uh, be bad if there weren't. Yeah, your draw is a plus 369, and Austin is basically a plus 500. What's surprising about those numbers? You acted like that was a, a oh. shocking set of numbers. No, it's just the, the sheer scope of a plus 500. Why? Why? Austin but, would be an underdog, but five plus 500 you know look we just going, went through it like going to those other going to those other numbers that we had earlier where chicago's a plus 600 inter miami's a plus 580 i'm you know i'm not viewing austin as being that bad on the road they are like so, again like uh, the everything we just went through sets up those numbers and, and lafc dominated at home Always scoring goals. Austin, always giving up goals on the road. Bad on the road. Like, that's the numbers you get. That That is entirely accurate, and LAFC wins. They win 3-1. No, I've got LAFC in this one, too, yes. <laughs> so you were shocked by the numbers, but you're agreeing with the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I'm agreeing with the scope. I'm agreeing with the idea, but not necessarily the number itself. Maybe I was thinking maybe like a 400 or something like that. It just comparing the those two plus sixes 
and Austin is a plus five. I'm like, Austin's better than a plus 500, even though they stink on the road. I know that. But no, I don't I have, think they're I better have, than a plus I have five. Absolutely, LAFC. In it's there. not. It's not a plus four hundred or a plus five hundred in a vacuum. It, it's at LAFC, and yes, they, in my opinion, should be a plus five hundred there. And it looks like Ricky is is jumping in on the plus five hundred. Uh, that's why they put that number that high because oh. it's going to take a number that high to lure anybody into taking Austin in this game. Jared, are you going to do it? No. Okay, I was just checking. And LAFC has, uh, they're going to Columbus and they get a quick turnaround. It's like two days after tonight, and then they're going to play in Columbus. So they got to get, you know, got to get what? points here. No, I just think it's a quick turnaround. <laughs> I think you're going to have, I think that your lineup is going to be rotated somewhat in Columbus. I think that you're going to try to do your damage tonight and get full points against Austin, knowing how bad Austin is on the road. I'm just looking ahead to the weekend where it could be, you know, rotated a little bit like it was with Colorado. It's still trying to chase a result, but they're going to get full points tonight. Is is anybody afraid of Columbus at this point? No. I mean, at home, okay, they, they've, they've won three games at home. They've played five. They've lost two. So I, I don't think that factors into anything LAFC is thinking. I think they're at home. They're going to expect to win, and I think they're going to – Expect whatever they put out in Columbus to be able to to get a win as well. That's yeah. where I'm thinking. Right now they're just under plus two hundred with crew at plus one thirty seven. Yeah, those numbers are crazy until you get through today. Uh, that's don't even try to jump on anything on the weekend before you get through today's games. That's 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 really dangerous. Yeah. Uh, speaking of dangerous, San Jose hosting Portland <laughs> ten thirty tonight. Portland unbeaten in seven straight against the Quakes. Five wins out of that seven. You go back to twenty nineteen. Longest unbeaten run by either team against the other in MLS play. San Jose, they've only lost one of their last five, including the 3-3 draw against uh, or on Saturday uh, against Vancouver. Uh, two wins out of those last five. Um, so they've had a bunch of draws, but they haven't. They've only lost one time. That's not bad. Um, now, here's a weird one. Um, seventh time since the start of last season that the Quakes had both scored and conceded at least three goals in the same match. <laughs> no other MLS team has done that m- more than four times in that span of time. Seven times for San Jose and Jarrett's ridiculous earthquakes. Geek. Uh, Portland set the club record for scoring seven in their win over Sporting Kansas City on Saturday. Tied an MLS record for goals and a half. Uh, with six goals in the second half, eight combined goals in the second half, tied the league record for combined goals in a half. Uh, if Bovisi scored two of San Jose's goals against Vancouver, his third multi-goal game, the only Quakes player with more than three multi-goal games in a single regular season is Juan Dolowski, who had six in 2012. Uh, first MLS appearance for Nathan Fogaccia. He scored two of Portland's seven goals on Saturday. First Portland player to score multiple goals in their first career match. Uh, Fogaccia and Sebastian Blanco each scored twice. Third time in club history that two players have scored multiple goals in a match. Felipe Mora and Abobasi in 20. Valeri and Adi in 2017. Fernando Adi, that's a blast from the past. Mm. What are the numbers on San Jose hosting the Portland Timbers? San Jose is a minus 103. Your draw is a plus 277. Portland is a plus 252. Okay. I don't know how to feel about those numbers. Uh, Jared, how do you feel about those numbers? I don't trust anything as far as I can throw it because Portland is, man, Portland is kind of sort of very broken. And they scored seven on the weekend, though. I, I know, but consider the sporting Kansas City on the other side. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I'm i not sold on Portland being fixed, and I am not sold on Kansas, on, on, on San Jose not doing something really weird and evil because they're a little more stable, but they still got a little bit of that Almeida blood in them. Uh, yeah. Give me, give me, give me, can't give me, uh, give me the Quakes. Okay. The Quakes have won back to back at home. Um, yeah. They lost the first game at home this season, but they haven't lost at home since. Three draws and then back to back wins uh, on the road. Portland, not exactly great. One win, three draws, two losses. They haven't won on the road since April 9th when they went to Vancouver. 
Uh, John, what are you taking? Um, I'm taking a wild drunken MLS after dark draw. Your over under at four and a half is a plus three fifty seven. Five and a half is a plus seven fifty two. I'm taking Quakes three two. Uh, I think it will be stupid. I, I think there will be goals. I think it will be ridiculous. Um, it could be part of the soccer quake phenomenon that Sharif is discussing. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I am going to go with San Jose winning three two, and it's going to be stupid, 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 stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, last one on the board before we go. Uh, Sharif asks about uh, says looks like some statements in the media landscape about Vela possibly leaving. Uh, what would convince him to stay versus leave this season? I haven't seen anything new on it. Um, he's was supposed to be out of contract in the summer. Has there been an official, or am I forgetting that they officially extended it? Or was it just talked about them going to extend it and it hasn't been officially extended? So many things have happened over the last couple of weeks. I want to make sure that I'm correct on this. I don't remember an official announcement about the extension. Uh, agree to a contract extension April 20. Okay, they did agree to it. But so the club announced that, not somebody saying they did. Uh, actually, somebody is saying they have the club okay, has what I, not said what anything yes. official. That's what I thought. That's where I thought it was too, Jason Nix. Uh, there had been reports that they had agreed to it. Uh, they have not. So I believe at the end of June, yes, his contract is up. Yes. Um, reports were a while back that he had agreed to an extension, but they haven't officially announced it yet. They might have it, and I don't know why they'd hold it or wait or whatever. I have no idea. Maybe he wanted to see what would happen with some of the clubs in Spain. That had always been the thing, was that maybe he wanted to go back to Spain. Uh, His wife is Spanish. Um, If the right opportunity materialized, maybe he wanted to see that. I don't know. Like, Sharif, I I haven't seen anything recently about the about him possibly leaving that had been talked about at the beginning of the season. Um, and then it was kind of cold water thrown on it that no, nah, he's not going anywhere. Why would you think that? that's crazy? What? Well, he's out of contract. Wow. Ah, why are you, why are you crazy? And that's kind of how the American soccer conversation goes at times. Like it's, there's definitely hive mind in, in the conversation. Uh, I don't know. Um, what would convince him to stay versus leave this season? Money, I think is one of the biggest things. Um, I don't know how much his love for LAFC is to say like, you know, I, yeah, I have to stay and and see this out and we have to win an MLS cup because that's what I came here to do. And we haven't done it yet. Um, They are the number one team in the West right now. They will absolutely have something to say about who wins MLS cup, but is that something that's going to make him say, I got to stay and see the job out. If a good offer materializes to go back to Spain or if, Club America comes in with a stupid pile of money. I don't know, honestly. And, and Vela's not an easy guy to get a sense for in, in that. Um, if he leaves, the, he, the LAFC is nowhere near the same team. If he stays, how long is he staying for? Is it just to get through the end of the season or is it an 18-month extension to get through next season? I don't know. Uh, the fact that it had reportedly been agreed to and it has not been officially announced, that, that gets your antenna up a little bit. So let's see what happens with Vela. I don't know exactly what would convince him to stay because the number one thing that kept coming up, Sharif, was uh, family and wife and Spain. And if if that's the case and there's a good opportunity on the table for him in Spain. I don't know if there's anything LAFC can do to keep him. I don't think the Miami possibility was all that strong unless things really fell apart in a relationship with him in LA. I wouldn't expect he'd play elsewhere in MLS. I I think Spain is the most likely possibility. Second would be a crazy amount of money in Mexico, but I think there's also a strong possibility he stays. It's just going to be down to what, what opportunities are on the table for him. I feel like we had this conversation, you know, when 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 the when the the story came out about you know the top, who are the who are the top new players in MLS? Who are the the overperformers so far early in the season? And you know, you've seen names like uh, Carol Sudersky, who who hasn't done a lot since those early games. Nope. Vela knocked a hat trick in his first game of the season. It hasn't been overwhelming since then. It's been fine. 
but it hasn't been overwhelming. So, I mean, it, it's like, what, what is he, where, what is he going forward? I guess was my question for his role with that team. Like, does it, does it change a bit? Like, do you, are you looking at a, Hey, we want you here because you are, you have a very much a lifeblood energy, the team and he does, but we're not going to just lean on you like we've done in the past. Vela can. According to Sofa score rankings, Vela is the 32nd ranked player in the league this season, uh, 7.2, which is, is very good. Um, yeah. Ronaldo Cisneros, fewer games, goal scorer. Again, goals are going to be rated a little bit more highly in this. Cisneros is, is ranked ahead of him. Uh, Nathan Harriel, the right back for Philadelphia, who's earned that spot, is ranked ahead of him. Um, Tiago Almada is ranked number seven in this. He is the highest rated newcomer in the league, uh, according to Sofa score, but didn't make the most influential additions list, uh, according <laughs> to MLSsoccer.com. Just saying. It, yeah. It's not, and yeah, it's not to say that Vela's not good. Vela's still very, very good. He's, but he hasn't played like the best player in the league that he had been before. He hasn't played like the amount of money that he would probably be asking for for an extension. And I wonder how much the injuries played into that. Just that he's been dealing with the last few years on and off. I mean, it's it's harder and harder to come back from those injuries the older he it gets. Is. It, it is, and he can still be good, but where does the money sort out and where does that fall? I, the longer it goes without an announcement of an extension, the more I got questions. Yeah. Because if it's done, why would you hold it? If it's not done, why is it not done? And yeah, I'm wondering if waiting to see what happens in Spain, last day of the season, who stays up, who goes down, what opportunities could be there for Vela. I'm wondering if that's it. We'll find out. But yeah, it's a weird situation, Sharif. I, I don't get it. I, I remember the, oh, no, everything's fine. No, he's going to he's going to he's going to stay. But they haven't announced it. So I don't know what's up with that. Um Reportedly, his contract's up in the middle of the season. We'll see what happens. Uh, make sure you get your fantasy teams in. Like I said before, um, f- this is a separate week for MLS according to their schedule, but it's not according to fantasy. It's the double game week situation, and you get points for both, unlike last year. So that part's changed. So you're absolutely looking at guys who are playing two games this week. You're looking at matchups that you like. Uh, Ryan Walker will have more of this stuff later in the season, hopefully. But he is in the process of, of figuring out what's next for him. Uh, and I think it involves possibly moving countries. So that could be a little complicated. So uh, we won't have the updates from Ryan. If anybody out there is interested in kind of creating that same idea of locks and considers and value picks uh, and posting them, we'll share them from soccer down here and just reach out and let us know if you're interested in, in uh, replacing Ryan for a little while until Ryan gets back and uh, getting sorted out to, to be able to do that again. It's been really helpful. It's been helpful to me. Uh, it's been helpful to, I think, a lot of people in the league. But you're looking at two game weeks. So you're, you're glancing at not just tonight's matchups, but who they play on the weekend. And like, John, you mentioned LAFC at home to Austin and in Columbus. If you're going to be on the road, Columbus is a place you don't hate being on the road in. You could be looking at LAFC players. Uh, I looked at NYC players heavily yep. in this because of the two games that they have at DC and then hosting Chicago. Uh, Sean Johnson was a big one for me. Tati Castellanos, uh, Tylus Magno. There's a lot of guys you can look at from an NYC perspective. Uh, Montreal is another one that I think you can look at. And I have Georgi Mihailovic in my team. Even though a game in Nashville is not going to be easy for them, they get RSL in the second game of the week. And in Montreal, RSL is a team that I don't think has traveled all that well. They don't play tonight is one thing you might want to say, okay, well, Montreal might be a little bit tired. RSL might be fresh. I think Montreal is a better team by far, and I think they're deep enough to get it done. So Montreal and NYC were the two teams that I really looked at and and pick the guys up from yeah right there with you i had lafc i've got nyc uh the defense for philadelphia going up against miami and portland i had uh wagner and glesnes as a part of who i was looking at from a Mm -hmm. defensive standpoint 
and then Seattle playing Houston and Colorado. I have some Sounders in my lineup as well, and I've got Ferreira for Dallas going up against Vancouver and Minnesota. Dallas was the other one. Thank you, Ricky, for for posting that because Dallas is in Vancouver. Even if they don't get a win, there should be goals, and then they host Minnesota. I liked Areola. I liked Ferreira in that one. So uh, Dallas, Montreal, and NYC were the three teams that I really focused on, but LAFC, Seattle are two others you could be considering. All right, rest of the day, um, 2 o'clock, stoppage time, facebook.com slash 929thegame, twitch.tv slash stoppage time 929 if you like the Twitch format. Uh, we take questions from both. So that will be at 2 o'clock. Mike and I will talk about the game from the weekend against the Revs, the game coming up against Nashville, more on Joseph, anything else that happens in the Atlanta United universe. We'll talk about it. We'll maybe talk a little bit about Nashville tonight as well as we will all be watching because that's where Atlanta's at. This weekend, again, in Nashville, but there's going to be a few more folks there this time. I think from Atlanta, but also from Nashville. It's going to be packed. It's going to be nuts. It's going to be nationally televised. Can't wait for that on Saturday. We'll be back tomorrow morning to talk more about it as well. Hopefully you can join us then. Mucha platio. Mucha platio. Mucha platio.